five, four, no, I'm joking. Five, four, three, two, one. EM Hotep family, you're tuning into the Pro Black Perspective on KWAZ Radio. Uh, today, we're going to continue with the Wretched of the Earth, going from pages 96 to 108. 12 pages as usual. Of course, make sure you check out the other programs on KWAZ Network. That is the Harsh Radio Podcast. You said what? Oh, 12, 12 pages. pages. Yeah, 12 pages. Harsh Reality Podcast, the uh, Bitter Medicine Podcast, and of course... Uh, the Revolutionary Matron, right? Uh, so, yeah, we're just going to jump right into it. Uh, for those of you who are interested, this is the tri- This is the third chapter, right? So we, we're getting through. Uh, it's supposed to be 240 pages, so we're going to be finished by uh, the end of August. But this is a good way to celebrate Black Friday, which is... Uh, and Black, Black August. By reading the works of those who came before us, who, those who had a message... Uh, notwithstanding their personal relationships, right? So, the trials and tribulations of national consciousness. So, history teaches us that the anti-colonialist struggle is not automatically written from a nationalist perspective. Over a long period of time, the colonizers have devoted their energies to eliminating iniquities such as forced labor, corporal punishment, unequal wages, and the restriction of political rights. Now, just to just, just jump right into it, let's just say this, Right? You set up, again, you want to look at humans as a sort of animal, right? An animal that does not, that understands that they are one group and that the other animals of the world, including other human beings, are another group, right? And so that one group if you look at it from an uh, almost like an anthropological, let me say anthropological, but let's say a biological perspective, right? If you look at it from a perspective of you know, animals and animals, right? You realize that forced labor, right? Uh, you know, one group forcing another group to work for them, right? Corporal punishment, one group punishing another group for not following the mores and behaviors of that one group unequal wages, giving your group more than the other group, and a restriction of political rights, again, giving your group more than the other group, this is a normal phenomenon, okay? Like I said, I looked at this hunter-gatherer video. It was actually pretty interesting in retrospect, right? Uh, it's this white boy. He goes to uh, you know, an African country, and he's interviewing these, uh, these, these hunter-gatherers, right? And, you know, obviously there are beautiful people, you know, uh, but the thing with this is that they are, they're concerned about hunting mostly, right? These are the men he's talking to and they're just concerned about hunting. Like their lives are centered around hunting, getting some good <laughs> food to Kill. eat. Yeah. Getting some good food to eat. You said killing? Their next meal. Yeah. Their next meal. It's, it's focused on that. But then they mention their engagement with another people. Like, there's another people a little near them which are, are herders. And so if you're a hunter, you see these cows. So this is the other perspective of what I was talking about earlier, right, of, of the Khoisan being chased away by the uh, whatever. You see these cows, and of course, just like you see a lion, you see a baboon, you see a, a turtle, you see a rat, you see anything. You see anything, and you're like, oh, meat, cool, right? So you see a cow and you're like, oh, meat, cool, right? Another person, however, who is like who that cow belongs to is not just like, oh, cool. You want to kill cows? That's your thing. Great. You killed my cow. Okay. You know, fun, right? No. Instead, they say, hey, what are you doing? Get out of here. We'll kill you. You understand? Now, now, like, like if you're not going to stop killing my cows, I'm going to kill you. And I'm going to kill your people. You know, that's the world. The world is not so, uh, so the way how we, you know, in the West, in this, you know, national structure, this colonial structure, the way we tend to look at things is, oh, well, you know, if, if, if he kills, if he kills, uh, like, like, like life is precious. 
You know, life is precious. Life is valuable. Uh, you know, you killed my cow. Well, it's just a cow. I'm a human being, right? That's not the same thing between herders and hunters. You know, it's not the same thing. It's not the same dynamics. It's not the same. We believe life is precious in a sense, and we, we fool ourselves into this idea because we have been colonized, and the co colonized, and the colonized people are told not to kill the colonizer. You understand? The colonizer's life is precious. That's what we are learning. Okay? That's not a thing in the real world. You know? So, actually, uh, for those of you on the Discord, I have this... Uh, this, actually, I put this quote, I put it on Twitter too. So if you check my Twitter, that only time I say. But it's like, the hunter gatherer eats everything he can kill. If he wants to, so long as it's safe to do so, and his prey is better dead than alive. So they didn't really kill their own dogs, you know? But they did kill, like, hyenas. They did kill lions. They did kill elephants, right? Uh, and I said, this is the rudiment of humanity, right? The lofty ideas of the value of life are just Western impositions. Humans, like all predators, are killers. You understand? Humans are killers. And, and, and it's, you know, we talk about, when we come to the West, how we have been denatured. You know, how we've been taken away from nature and we no longer understand. Because I could even say, because I remember when I was younger, my mother was telling me about how she would kill goats. You know, like, because I understand this. You're a herds person, right? You're a herdsman. I mean, understand that if you are eating meat, even if you're eating vegetables, let's be for real. You're killing something. You don't really, the only life you value when it comes to your eating is your own. You understand? Because the plant was alive. Like, understand, the plant is, like, plants are life, right? And if you're eating meat, animals are life. You, you, you're going through life killing, but you're told, no, don't kill humans, and particularly don't kill humans who are above you. You understand? That's really what your societies are about, if we're being 100. Uh, but anyway, uh, Bitter Medicine says, peace, fam, so peace, fam. But yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a pretty interesting perspective. I'm definitely, like I said, I want to, I'll probably write it out someday, but I think it's a really interesting perspective when it comes to just just what it is now now do i advocate you know just going around killing people no i don't no, i hope not uh, uh okay this guy hopes not which is not important whether he hopes so or not the point is that uh I mean, you want to get flagged that's what i'm saying you want to talk about killing people i'm trying to say you, you see what i'm saying flag you see like i said the western imposition the the, the danger of 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 the, like, essentially, we're being controlled by another people and told, hey, look. They, like, like I said, the restriction of political rights. There you have it. It's normalized. It's normal. And you might say, well, look, it's uh, my political right to... No, it's not your political right to kill. Political yeah. right to talk about. I'm gonna, come on, bro. According to uh, the powers that be. You understand? I mean, it's it's more so for us to understand that you know, you go back into time. You go back into time and you say to yourself, because even, even before, let, let's, let's be for real. Even before we were having a conversation about somebody who was stealing, uh, who was a thief. And the rest of everybody else was saying, yeah, it's good to kill him. You included. Good, sir. So <laughs> it's, 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 again, you know, you Ooh. have, you crazy, yeah, Machiavelli. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but but the 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 thing is that you know again it's normalized. You know you you understand yes in those societies yes you do kill a thief, but then you say to yourself the thief of the lower class. You understand the thief of the upper class is safe. Nah. The thief of the upper class is safe. Nah. What do you mean nah? He's not. How, 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 how long has has the, have the thieves of the upper class been in power now? The the, the girl who stole the girl who steals that thing she's killed on sight. Okay, the guy who stole who steals the oil out of the the bank he's killed in twenty years if that. In fact, in fact, wasn't wasn't that the whole conversation we had earlier? This this dictator he was a dictator in Nigeria, right? The guy dies of natural causes. He was stealing billions 
of of money out of out of the Nigerian bank. P proved in, in in plain sight. Dies of natural causes. There's no nah here. There's no nah. If the, if, the, if the girl is killed from stealing a little car mirror, which is not, you know, a good thing to do, but if she's killed there for killing a car mirror, right? And this guy's stealing billions from a bank. You understand? It's clear what this principle is, you know? And I mean, I've, I've actually said this earlier. When, when I wrote my first poetry book a long time ago, it's not published, so don't worry about it. Uh, I said, uh, you know, the, the, the Ten Commandments were pretty much like something like for the, to the master like you have to read them and say to the master like that are the master or something like that but it's like thou shalt not kill the master you understand that's what you're really learning you're not learning not to kill you're learning not to kill the master you learn not to kill from the master uh, the, not to kill not to steal from the master you understand nah. what do you mean nah what do you keep saying nah for <laughs> why do you keep saying nah i don't understand that's what it is. If, 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 you, if you have a dictator who's stealing billions of dollars and he dies of natural causes, then, yeah, that's what it is. Because the guy's not even doing anything creative. He's legit stealing the money. It's not, it's not like, you know, it's not like a metaphor. Like, you know, somebody might say, you know, Jeff Bezos is stealing from people. Like, that's a metaphor. He's metaphorically stealing. This guy is directly putting his hands in the cookie jar and getting caught. And walking away with cookies. You understand? Um, and a jar. <laughs> exactly. You can't walk away with a damn jar. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that's what it is. So it's like, it ain't no nah here. You know, like, if if he had done that and he were killed, that would be different. But there are leaders in Africa who've been there since the time that, since, since for as long as I've been on this earth, there are leaders, the, the same leaders have been in Africa. That's a long time. That's a long time, bro. Especially if you're stealing. But, you know, it is what it is. So this fight for democracy against man's oppression gradually emerges from a universal... Like, can, I, can you imagine somebody stealing as long as I've been alive? I'm saying that's, that's like, that's a long time right there. Uh, but shh, to get away with it. That's, I'm saying that's decades upon decades upon decades. Upon decades. Anyway, yeah, this guy, this joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, man, at least I'm not young, you know? <laughs> is that a diss? <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Age is, uh, you know, age is good for some reason. Uh, age is good. Age is wisdom, bro. All right. Uh, <laughs> this fight for democracy <laughs> against... What do you say? That's what you want to call it. Yeah, hey, that's what I call it. All right. This fight for democracy... Age gives you respect. Didn't you tell me that before? Keep All right. Reading, man. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the respect, bro. This fight for democracy against man's oppression gradually emerges from a universalist neoliberal confusion to arrive, sometimes laboriously, at a demand for nationhood. Yeah, against man's oppression, generally, gradually, yeah. But the unpreparedness of the elite, the lack of practical ties between them and the masses, their apathy, and yes, their cowardice at the crucial moment in the struggle are the cause of tragic trials and tribulations. Instead of being the coordinated crystallization of the people's innermost aspirations, instead of being the most tangible, immediate product of popular mobilization, national consciousness is nothing but a crude, empty, fragile shell. The cracks in it explain how easy it is for young, independent countries to switch back from nation to ethnic group and from state to tribe, a regression which is so terribly detrimental and prejudicial to the development of the nation and national unity. As we shall see, such shortcomings and dangers derived historically from the incapacity of the national bourgeoisie and undeveloped countries to rationalize popular practice. In other words, their incapacity to attribute it any reason. So basically saying the nation, if, if the leadership... This is it. This is why. This is why I advise people. You know, Boko Haram, Nakiru. This is why I'm an old, wise person. Uh, because <laughs> right, <laughs> call yourself that. Uh, mm -hmm. Hey, you call me old. You said you said age and wisdom. You know, uh, age and wisdom and respect. You know, you told they're me they're correlated. Doesn't right. mean it's always. You told the case. me old people are respected. You, in fact, you, you uh, actually recorded uh, telling me that. You actually recorded fact. me telling me that. So the, the, you even said it was like even a maid could be respected. So I mean, shit. All right. Okay. So, what's that gotta do with what you just said, though? No. All right. So let's keep. I'm, I'm gonna keep reading. All right. Is that okay? Please, please. Yes, I, I prefer that. Yeah. All right. As we shall see, such shortcomings. Uh, so what I'm saying is that I, as I explained though to everybody that 
you want the leadership. If the leadership is not on point, then the people will go back to what had pop worked in the past. You know, if if the leaders, I didn't I didn't get that from from the passage you just read. That's why. That's why. That's why they call me wise, bro. That's why I'm old. Okay, no, I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> All right, look. So let's go back. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So look, he says uh, the crack in its explain how easy it is young independent yeah. country is to switch back from nation to ethnic group and from state to tribe. A regression which is so judgmental. He says, as we shall see, such shortcomings and dangers derive historically from the incapacity of the national bourgeoisie, those are the elites, the leaders, so on and so forth, in undeveloped countries to rationalize popular praxis. In other words, the incapacity to attribute it to any reason. So he's like, what, what, what they're doing popular, popular praxis, by the way, praxis is one of the best words. But basically, praxis is, you know, when you say we shouldn't, it's not just about theory, it's not just about action, but it's about sure. praxis. Praxis mm -hmm. is uh, action you know, is theory based action, you know? Yeah, so yeah. theory with no action is, yeah. Uh, exactly. So praxis, that, 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 I heard that word in, uh, when I was in college. But this is, uh, this is the thing, though. It's like, yeah, so that's what he's saying. He's saying that the national bourgeoisie do not, like, they can't rationalize the popular praxis. Or they, or they have any capacity to attribute it to any reason. And basically, in a nutshell, they are leading, but the people, but they, they don't even articulate it well, you know? Or they don't, or, or even they're just doing it wrong. You understand? They're doing it wrong. And so what you get from that is that because if the leaders are doing it wrong, if they're not even rationalizing, if the people don't have faith in what they're doing, right? Uh, you know, like you're like, hey, let's just build this railroad. Because this is the thing. Anytime you see somebody building anything, somebody says, well, what about the hungry people? I mean, there's you a know? purpose behind it. But then yeah, exactly. Will, you well, have to rationalize. Railroad in my town versus that time. You said what? You know, like, why are you building this road here when I need a road here? In my exactly. Community? Always. Or oh, oh, like, why are we paying taxes and all the roads are going to Abuja? You know? I mean, someone's always complaining about something. Anyway. Someone's always. But here's the thing. If you don't rationalize it, if you don't, if you don't capture their imagination, if you don't, then essentially you're going to have dissent and you're going to have regression. Because even, okay. like, like, like I said, I was talking to this, uh, I was talking to this sister about, uh, because, you know, she like talking about Nigeria or whatever, right? So she's <laughs> like, hey, Fulani, she's like, this guy Buhari is, you know, trying to build a road, a highway or whatever, or something to Niger. And, you know, when he was asked the reason, look at this, when he was asked the reason, he says, well, I got family there or something like that, you know, which is like very not the Black right people. thing to say, yeah. you know? But here's the thing. So, you know, this person says, why didn't he build it to, why didn't she, why didn't he build the road to, you know, this highway or whatever to Ghana? Because Ghana is, even his. Ghana is. Yeah. So because Ghana is, uh, no, I just said, give me two seconds. <laughs> oh, <know>? my bad. <laughs> anyway, because Ghana is, uh, you know, like like could be an economic hub, could be a pan African. Uh, of course, support, like right. But the thing is, et yeah. The thing is this, though. Well, one, obviously, he did it into this year because, you know, his reasoning. But, like, you say, oh, we have family there, right? Your family in this year, so on and so forth. Now, bump if you're family, not bro. Fulani, you said what? I said, man, bump your family. Don't want to worry about that. Yeah, exactly. If you're not Fulani, like, you're Fulani, you're like, oh, that's good. I do have family in Niger. You know, because yeah. essentially uh, there are Fulani uh, yeah, the, the in the Niger tribal groups, they, and in yeah. Nigeria, right? But the other groups... They're going to hear this same reasoning and say, yeah, why am I in this nation? You understand? Why am I paying taxes to a government where the, only the people in the north are benefiting from uh, this? And then when I need roads or when I need to engage with and, and see, it might even be that they want a road to their own ethnic group, you know, to the to the to the areas that their ethnic groups are present. They might want that, but the point being that if right, the national bourgeoisie the country so everybody can benefit from it. Exactly. Country. Exactly. But if that's the case, right? Cuz you know, it, it it could be, look, it could be that that road to Niger if you if you if you if you know, you could rationalize it to say, "Oh yeah, we're just doing this like we're just doing roads. We're doing roads everywhere." You know what I'm saying? This is a road to so on and so forth but that's, and that's economically. Well, if you don't, if you do, if you have the incapacity to rationalize 
the popular practice or the incapacity to attribute it to any reason, then sure. You know, again, you're always going to find somebody to disagree, but you have to get up there and 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 do something uh, and say something. And you have to do something. You have to do you have, you have a budget. You have to spend it, you know, and what the best like, like 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 what the here's this. Yeah, right. Well, no. Well, yeah. But yeah. But the 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 best I like there's no best idea. You know, there's no best thing to do. It's simply that you do something and there's going to be and you have to either you have to optimize how many people minimize uh, how many people disagree or agree. You know, that's it. Uh, yeah, that's it. That's it. And, and if, and if, you, and if, it, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, you know, whatever. But you but that's your point. You're, if you're a leader, you're supposed, you're supposed to be building. You're supposed to be developing the infrastructure. You know, you're supposed to be using n navigating the budget towards developing the infrastructure, uh, particularly for future leaders. But again, you know, in places exactly. like, especially in, for, the, for the nation, you're not you know, doing things for today, but for tomorrow, essentially. Yeah, but that's what that's I'm saying. A road, a road to Niger is, is a it's road to Niger. Road. Or well, anybody no, but that, that doesn't benefit the populace. But this is not well, about, yeah. talk about them anyway. I know you can make an example, but I want to get into that too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. All right, sure. All right. <laughs> the characteristic virtually endemic weakness of the underdeveloped country's national conscience is not only the consequence of the colonized subject's mutilation by the colonial regime, it can also be attributed to the apathy of the national bourgeoisie, its mediocrity, mediocrity, and its deeply cosmopolitan mentality, right? The national bourgeoisie, which takes over power at the end of the colonial regime, is an underdeveloped bourgeoisie. Its economic clout is practically zero in any case, no way commensurate with that of its metropolitan counterpart, which it intends replacing. You see, uh, again, the economic clout of the leaders in Africa are, were not as great or not as, as profound as the economic clout of the colonizers. You understand? Like, like this white boy who's, you know, the, the governor of, of the Gold Coast, right? He has deep connections. In, the, in England. You understand? He has connections in France. He has connections in Italy. He has connections in Sierra Leone. He has connections in uh, Burkina Faso. You know, he has deep connections. You, like, let's use uh, Niede as an example, right? You were a school teacher. You know what I mean? You were a school teacher in some little town in Tanzania. Now you're the president. You take the part. Now, obviously, it's a different country. So let's just say the governor of Tanzania, right? Uh, you take the position of the governor of Tanganyika, actually, right? And whereas this individual had clout all over the world, you know, you just had a few parents who were like, yeah, you did a good job teaching my kid, uh, you know, uh, like, like reading, you know? Like, you did a good job at that. It's different, you know, the, 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 now, of course, you know, he, he advocated for a, a version of socialism. So you might say, oh, he isn't national bourgeoisie or, you know, if you're being very literal, but you know, the lesson remains all the same. You want the leadership to have that economic clout. You understand? You want that leadership to have that economic clout. And that's why I advocate those kind of solutions, you know, in my literature is to say that, you know, you want to develop, you want your people to develop economics uh, economically, uh, even prior to taking up leadership, because economics is a very uh, fundamental tool in the uh, the human arsenal, particularly as we as we progressed from the hunter gatherer economy. You understand? But even in that economy, you know, economically, which might econ economy, which might be uh, like, you, you know, you could have probably used the economy somehow. Like, if you were a good hunter, let's I mean, say. even like, them, they have their own economy. You think of tools to hunt for, uh, bartering between what meat to eat today, all that kind of stuff, too. It may not be basic, maybe rudimentary, but it's still an economic system in itself. All right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, technically, yeah. Oh, PC's in the building. PC. All right. Uh, 
It's a willful narcissism. So he says, it's willful narcissism. The national bourgeoisie have lulled itself into thinking that it can supplant the metropolitan bourgeoisie to its own advantage. Uh, yeah, narcissism. So, but independence, which literally forces it back against the wall, triggers catastrophic reactions and obliges it to send out distress signals in the direction of the former metropolis. So basically, you start to fail. You start saying, well, actually, it turns out I don't have... Like, I don't know how to do the things that you are doing, right? Because, again, if you have connections in... Let's go back to the, the Gold Coast. You have connections. Like, like you can't sell gold, okay? Like, it's, it's actually hard to sell gold without the West, you know? Uh, not to say that African people haven't been selling gold before. But, again, you know, let's just go into this, this make-believe example where... Because I can't... Actually, let me see if I can remember what Nkrumah was doing before he was president i believe that he was a secretary of something right so you're a secretary well secretary might have a little more connections but you're a secretary right it's actually pretty difficult to sell gold uh outside of the western paradigm sure once upon a time you could have transported gold uh via the uh trans-saharan trade right uh however that trade, by the time that, you know, Nkrum was alive, that trade is long gone, right? Uh, and the pricing might not even be as well, right? The, you were trading this gold with England. You say, England, get out. We don't want to deal with you anymore, right? Now you realize that your economy is shaped in such a way that you are digging gold. People are digging gold, expecting to get paid for digging gold, but you can no longer sell this gold. Because your main buyer, or even your buyers, the Europeans, you just told them buzz off. So now you have to, you're obliged to send out distress signals in the direction of the former metropolis. Now you're saying, hey, UK, actually, if you guys want to just spend a little more on the gold, you know, much obliged. You understand? And of course, that's a weakness. Because what happens is, your country is now, uh, like, if you do not reshape your economy, your economy is now dependent on this weakness of yours where you cannot unload the material that you had, that you, that you basing your economy on, you know? Uh, most people will say diversify, uh, but that's it, it. that's it. Uh, but this is, this is the extreme form of diversify, uh, just, uh, of, of a lack of diversification, right? So he says the business elite and university graduates who make up the most educated category of the new nation are identifiable by their small numbers, their concentration in the capital, and their occupations as traders, landowners, and professionals. This national bourgeoisie possess neither industrialists nor financiers. So those are the people that you would really want. The national bourgeoisie in the undeveloped countries is not geared to production, invention, creation, or work. All its energy is channeled into intermediary activities, right? Networking and scheming seem to be its underlying vocation. The national bourgeoisie has a psychology of a businessman, not that of a captain of industry. And it should go without saying that the rap rapacity of the colonists and the embargo system installed by colonialism hardly left it any choice. So uh, basically, the, the, the colonists... The colonists were not making captains of industries in Africa. You understand? Like just the same, the colonists are not making captains of industry of Africans, period. Whether it's Africans in, Africans in America or, or otherwise. You know? Uh, because actually, this is actually a really important point, too. Because a lot of people are under the impression that people in America, right, could uh, be that element of, of uh, you know, business acumen in Africa, right? But it's very important to, to, to peep this, you know? The people in America, right, are mostly traders, landowners, and professionals, not so much industrialists and financiers. You understand? They are more so business people, right? And this is, this is, this is everywhere. Like I said, this is, he's talking about North Africa right now, but this is everywhere in Africa, right, where where there are Africans who do have that better economic say. Like, even, like, let's say Brother uh, Machiavelli, you know? This, this is kind of describes him. He's more trader, landowner, professional, businessman, not necessarily industrialist, financier, or captain of industry. I mean, it's not just, obviously, Machiavelli, but this is, all, like, all of us, right? 
we are not necessarily captains of industry in the sense of, and now, of course, now there are exceptions. There are exceptions in America. There are exceptions in Africa, too. But this is what the focus should be on. You know, because a lot of times what people are saying or dreaming is, you know, well, what if African-Americans came and were financiers? And it's true. African-Americans do have a very high income, you know, uh, uh, relatively speaking, for a black population. Right. But that's not going to be enough as a financier. You understand? The, 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 the financier is more like, actually, if you look at Nigeria, it would be Dan Gote. You know, this guy is a captain of industry. Uh this guy is an industrialist. He's he's uh, producing things. He, he he has productive. That's the producing kind of individual. Extracting. That's, that's, that's I think that's what you're trying to get to towards your extracting, extracting the resources, resources from from, from the, the land, land or producing, producing goods and, so, and not necessarily like providing a service per se. That makes sense. Or providing like a business that has like a restaurant where you do um, you know other things, but more so you're providing things that. Everybody will use not only in that country, but you can use as trade. Yeah. So sense. yeah. So so basically, so th his his lingo is kind of Marxist. Uh, it's it's kind of. Well, so, talks about like a lot of in industry and all that. Like yeah, you, ma ma Marxism. You know, the bourgeoisie are the owners of physical capital. Yeah. Okay. So the owners of physical capital, physical capital being those things that can produce a good, those industrial. Uh, like factories that could produce goods. The the thing is that you know you come to America and you realize that a lot of black, like there are black people who own factories, just like there are black people in Africa who own factories. But it's not as popular as <laughs> as you would think. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, be, like, be, having a factory is not a popular that, period. You know, business. Yeah, maybe they sell goods or they provide a yeah, service exactly. that makes sense. Like and when I say goods, I'm talking like maybe restaurant. Or they like, sell, like instead clothes, of produce, instead of yeah, retail. Like it's retail. It's retail versus commercial uh, creating wholesale. You yeah, know yeah. what I'm saying? So you can they like 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 that's the big difference. Uh, like we can sell things, but as far as producing things, it's not as common around the world. But that's the difference between Dan Gote and. You know, whomever, you know, mm -hmm. like, and like and that's there, but, um, uh, also those people in the industry. But you think of, I like to think of banks in that way where you can get an investment for and it can give investments to start other businesses, other entities, other endeavors, and they gain interest in that way. So, a way a person that can help, uh, incubate different businesses as well. Yeah, so, so you wouldn't exactly. So, even if you have a high income, you're not necessarily a financier, that's uh, the point, uh, sure, yeah. you know. Uh, because, because, you know, if you still have expenses, you know, it doesn't matter, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like you, if you loan out some money that you need before a year is over, then you're screwed. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. the national bourgeoisie has the psychology of the business. So not the kind of So that's really important thing. Uh, under the cloning system of bourgeoisie that accumulates capital is in the realm of the impossible. Uh, to our thinking, therefore, the historical vocation of an authentic national bourgeoisie as an underdeveloped country is to reveal its status as bourgeois and as an instrument of capital and to become entirely subservient to the revolutionary capital which the people represent. So that's just a nonsense paragraph that isn't even like, I, I, should I try to understand it or just whatever, you know? I'll just say just whatever for now. Unless somebody thinks I should try to understand it. But it's probably I was just trying to peek, but I was lost what he was trying to say. Oh, you want me to send? Oh, yeah, I forgot to share it with you guys. Oh, Kater's in the building. Uh-oh. Now we got to be on our best behavior. You know? Oh, hey, what's the time pimp? Oh, you see, that's my best behavior. And this dude starts talking about pimping. And, you know, like, yo, classic, man. All right. <laughs> like, just classic, man. Hey, what's up, pimp? All right. Like, I'm not being recorded. I have to do it. <laughs> All right. Uh, all right, let's just read this. Let's see. Under the colonial system of bourgeoisie that accumulates capital is in the realm of the impossible. So... Yeah, because, see, the, the thing is that he keeps going from na national question. bourgeoisie to, uh, to uh, what's his face? National bourgeoisie to metropolitan bourgeoisie, so it's a little confusing. But, yeah, oh, uh, yeah, no, this actually makes sense. So he's saying on a colonial system, with the colonizer is present, when the colonizer is there, right, you're sure. not going to own a factory, you know, sure, that doesn't make it like that's what he yeah. said. That's what that's why you mean. How okay. he said <laughs> no, under no, the colonial system, said, a bourgeoisie like, that accumulates the capital, capital is capital is the realm of the impossible. Yeah. So like and, basically um, the British are there. They're not going to you're not going to just sprout up a factory. You know what I'm saying? OK. In fact, well, I'm assuming when you say it's capital, I, I'm that's a factor. Assumption is like 
Yeah, yeah, I didn't. I wasn't I was putting this as like owning industry necessarily. I'm talking about like, like gaining, you know, assets, and money. In that yeah, way. yeah, yeah. No, I didn't no, see how no. that was impossible. No, I, I mean, uh, like I, I get why you would say that, no. but it's like, yeah, no. The factory is the capital. You know what I mean? Okay, if that's if that's what he's pertaining to, like based on that same financier and dust industry conversation, it's sure, I, I can believe that. Yeah, no, I mean, like that's the way Marx uses it, right? So he says, to our thinking, therefore, the historical vocation of an authentic national bourgeoisie in an undeveloped country is to repudiate its status as bourgeoisie, uh, as bourgeois, and an instrument of capital, and to become entirely subservient to the revolutionary capital which the people represent. So I guess what he's saying is that, uh, you know, like, 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 basically, because he's using the word wrong right here. You know, there's no national bourgeoisie. You know, if, like, like, for instance, like, like I said, you go to Nigeria, the bourgeoisie is this banker, right? It's not like he's using the bourgeoisie as his, like earlier he points out the bourgeoisie is the nurse, the bourgeoisie is the, uh, you know, so on and so forth. These I'm are not bourgeoisie. This is what he's trying to say. Exactly. What do you say? Because he said, look, I'm, I'm, that's why I'm confused because yeah. he's, he's using the bourgeoisie like very, like a broad stroke over a bunch of different people. Yeah, exactly. He's talking about industry for this year. So no, 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 no. That's what I'm you saying. Know. He, because he, like realistically that's speaking, said, that's the confusion. Capital, that's the realist. That's the confusion because and that's why I said this book is okay. this book is actually hard to read. Because, okay. again, right. the national bourgeoisie are not nurses, they're not dock workers, they're not so on and so forth. Those would be, at best, petty bourgeoisie, or they would be proletariat, you know? Uh, however, uh, he's saying, because right now he's also saying there's other people that, in a place of privilege, right? Uh, in a place of privilege in the colonial system as compared to the lumpen, which is, okay, sure, uh, or the peasant. But... They, he said that they're now entirely subservient to the revolutionary capital, which the people represent. And of course, like, again, they're not bourgeoisie. You know, the nurse is not a bourgeoisie. She may be well off. Sure, she's well she's off. Not, she's, she doesn't own a house. She's not. Property. No, she <laughs> does, uh, well, yeah, well, or she just doesn't, under, she doesn't produce anything. She's not, she sure. doesn't, like, she I don't know if I, service. exactly. Let's just say. Th that's why that's why Marxism Marx Marx Marxist uh, dialogue is really outdated. But if you look at it from the perspective of an industrial economy, you realize like he's centering the industrial economy because he realizes that those people eventually became the leadership of okay. England. You know, but yeah, again, I, I, it doesn't apply to Africa, uh, where in under the colonial system, whereas there might be uh, factories and so on and so forth. Uh, in Africa, or, although they weren't actually, they were, uh, they were, they were all abroad. Well, it was more so that you would extract resources. You 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 develop a colony. You would get the resources, and then you send them to uh, a nation with factories. You know what I mean? Uh, and and so like technically, so that that's actually where the problem comes because technically there are no proletariat there. You get what I'm saying? Uh, technically, the proletariat would be in. England, because I remember, like, like you, you guys were talking about, because uh, one sister was bringing up how Finland was a pretty nice economy, and you realize that Finland, it, like, most of its economy is uh, industrial, you know, most of its economy is factory, uh, like seventy five percent, the other twenty five percent like service or something, but that that is where the resources that are stolen from Africa go, you know what I'm saying? So so the so the so the British or whomever. Uh, would 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 set up these colonies, extract these resources, and then send those resources to uh, like 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 think of Japan, you know, like Japan is not necessarily because uh, Japan was another example that this person used, but the Japan is not necessarily in the Congo getting out these resources, no, but Japan uh, trades with America, who's in the Congo getting these resources, and America says, yeah, make this for me, and I'll buy it from you. And that's what that's what. So then Japan would have the proletariat. What 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 the people who are extracting it like for some reason Marx just doesn't include them in this whole paradigm. Maybe you could consider them proletariat. Well, maybe, maybe it's assumed. Maybe, maybe it's assumed that they are uh, included. Well, yeah, exactly. Maybe you could say they're proletariat. Maybe, but uh, it's not really the case. Because I, I think maybe possibly you actually would say that that's just an older economy. Uh, like it's just not capitalism, mm -hmm. but slavery. Uh, but uh, but it's it's like again, like it's it's complicated. Um, I, I wouldn't even use it. But yeah, that's what he's saying over there. But 
uh, like basically saying, oh, well, you know, now that the like these bourgeoisie are now trying to benefit from the people and try to you know relate with the people. It's like, yeah, because they were the people. They were not bourgeoisie. They they like, you know, the resources were stolen and sent to uh, to, to Japan. It, it, they were not like that. Like if they were a part of that process, like the dock worker is a part of that process of loading the ships so that the ships can send the resources to Japan. But they weren't themselves in the factories. You know what I mean? Like they could strike and impact this, this factory abroad, but they themselves were not really working in the factory. So may, maybe, possibly, you could call them proletariat. Um, but but the, the issue is that in this book, and you know, you guys could look back, but in this book, uh, Fanon calls them the bourgeoisie, which doesn't make sense, you know? Uh, like I said, it could, at best, petty bourgeoisie, uh, maybe proletariat, but they wouldn't be the bourgeoisie. Although they would be highly paid, you get what I'm saying? So in an underdeveloped country, the imperative, oh, kind of like, actually, if you think about like African-Americans, you would not call, generally speaking, African-Americans bourgeoisie. You know what I mean? Like, generally speaking, they'd be proletariat, you know, petite sure. petit bourgeoisie. Or, well, yeah, I'm basically I'm saying you don't well, look at income alone. That's what I'm saying. Uh, notwithstanding, sure. you don't look at income alone. But like, mm. again, if you don't own capital, you're not the bourgeoisie, you know? Uh, oh, OK. Yeah, well, that, that, that's like the definition of bourgeoisie. Say what do you say? No, I'm not going to say it. Was you I, wasn't, say? I wasn't trying to be a joke, but like, I'm not trying to cause any controversy. You're not trying to be a joke, you said? No, I wasn't, it wasn't a joke. Like, I was a serious question, but like, some people just don't believe that person may be classified as African American, you know? Who? So, oh. <clears throat> I was going to say Rihanna. Like, for example, <laughs> uh, and, you know, some people may be like, well, no, she, you know, I don't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i mean yeah well she is she's an immigrant but uh uh rihanna well yeah so i'm saying no i said generally speaking i was talking about generally speaking right? i know that's all i know said generally that's why i was you know like, like you know like basically black people in the hood make a lot of money but they're not bourgeoisie you know what i mean uh that's what i'm saying um not yeah, so much yeah, yeah. like rihanna has ownership of a factory and like most of her wealth is from that mm -hmm. so sure. like technically like it's 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 like I said, it's a tough call because, again, th this is Marx is talking in an economy uh, 150 years ago. I don't know if they had celebrities like and see, that. And see, that, that's, that's yeah. something I will say about about this. Um, it's like a foundationally sure people can you know base their their beliefs, their ideologies on these concepts, but they need some updates, you know. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, for, for now we can't just apply like blanketly. Well, yes, because he said it. Okay, but that was in that time period for that space when industrial the industrial age was at that time. Yeah, we and the industrial age was just coming out. And this is the thing. So it's like, you know, you I don't know if they had celebrities, uh, like that, like celebrities who then went into uh, business practices. No, 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 like, I doubt you know? that. I doubt uh, that. Like oh, exactly, it's like, and and if it if, and the thing is that it's not the major. It's not These as major, so it's yeah, exactly. It's an exception. So Rihanna gets her like Rihanna when she's a singer is a petty bourgeoisie. When she dabbles in uh, her own in like owning ownership of a uh, conglomerate, then mm. like Brand technically possibly yeah. she's she's bourgeoisie. You know, technically. Sure. Uh, but I'm I'm yeah. not hundred percent on that because uh, it's, it's just confusing. Kate, you know, Kate, aren't you a red flag? Don't you wave the red flag? <laughs> red, red. <laughs> okay. What's the Chinese? No, that's the, the red flag is the communist. Ah, never mind. All right. What? Um, no, I don't wave the red flag. I'm, I'm, I'm a socialist for sure. That's what I, I said. Socialism. That's what I said. But, uh, I, you know, not playing. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't wave the red flag. Oh, uh, yeah. dang. Yo, he's, he's, <laughs> this guy, yo, yo, he, he's afraid of McCarthy right now. You know <laughs> no, I don't wave the red flag. I, I don't do that. No, 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 no. He's just, Yo, me thinks she not protesting much, right? <laughs> I have to explain, me being in the Caribbean, and the Caribbean, we do not have no bourgeoisie. Um, Fadden describes really? this very good. There's a national, there are a few urban professionals like lawyers and doctors yeah. who have a little bit of money, but we don't have factories in the Caribbean, like a bourgeoisie who invest in capital and, and, and build factories, and you have this... Mm -hmm. this well, some white people got factories. Some white people got factories. I mean, say? I said some white people no, got factories. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but these, yeah, yeah these like very small factories with rum yeah. and maybe with cocoa. But um, coffee and stuff. Well, I know I was yeah. buying some juice. I know I was buying some juice down there that, that they, uh, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they produce. Yeah. Oh, that juice was banging. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> But that's 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 yeah that's that's uh that's that's capital that's capital in far as I'm concerned yeah it's capital it's not a, maybe not to what he's talking about so what about this you call I, Rihanna Rihanna is what what is Rihanna bourgeoisie petty bourgeoisie yeah. what do you yeah, say um, I would think um, I know he didn't say he about to go to jail Rihanna is a petty bourgeoisie petty bourgeoisie because um, yeah, yeah the real bourgeoisie is is. is is from is, is is from the US or from from the UK and they own hotels in the Caribbean. That's the capital. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, wait, hold on a second. But her ownership of the makeup line that, that doesn't yeah. that doesn't make her oh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, because you have okay, to extract okay. like the, the soil, the clay from the ground, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, she's exploiting yeah, Indians. True, 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 true. She's exploiting yeah. India. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. So okay. what what is she? Well, that makes her te technically a bourgeoisie. Damn, my Rihanna! That makes her a bourgeoisie. Another yeah. one buys the dust, man. Damn it! Yeah, you, you saying that? You saying that in this her. in this revolution she can't be side by side with me? I gotta go after her. Damn it! Yeah, for sure. Damn. Don't, don't worry. You gonna make an exception? <laughs> Exactly. Nah, you pretty. Don't worry about it. You keep exploiting, girl. <laughs> <laughs> you keep good. exploiting, girl. Just, just put down the, put down the whatever, right? Put down the whip, you know. All right. Uh, actually, now nah, I'm joking. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Pause. Oh. All right. <laughs> well, that's Rihanna, though. Come on, like what? You're gonna say you gotta sign in to watch the video now. <laughs> <laughs> it's Rihanna, though. Come on, like, don't cap. Nah, right. <laughs> like Rihanna. All right. About, uh, what's her name? Nikki. What? This is not. A, let me stop. Yeah. Right. What's wrong with you, man? Yo. <laughs> you don't want to talk about whip. Yeah. It's Rihanna though. It's, it's Rihanna though, oh, man. Oh, like, okay, it makes it fine. Okay. Yeah, it's Rihanna. Like what? She's like, uh, like, like, like. Yeah. Yeah. All right. In an undeveloped country, the imperative duty. <laughs> oh yeah. Thanks, yeah, yeah. brother. Thanks, Kater. I mean, you know what I'm saying, man. It's Rih yeah, Rihanna. Rihanna. Yeah. Like. Like when I say Rihanna, you know what comes to mind. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, ain't too many other words. Not talking about playing Uno. <laughs> wow, pause, man. <laughs> I just got demonetized, right? Oh wait, no, I was never, I was never monetized to begin with. <laughs> All right. Anyway, in an undeveloped country, the imperative duty of an authentic national bourgeoisie is to betray the vocation to which it is destined, to learn from the people, and to make available to them the intellectual and technical capital it called from its time in colonial university. So again, this is actually pretty interesting. In an undeveloped country, the imperative duty. He's saying that these people, the national bourgeoisie, are so to call from time to time and anti-colonial uh, universities. Uh, no, what they learn, the intellectual and technical capital are called from the, the, the colonial universities. You know, this is one of the most disconcerting impressions, you know, that, like, one of the consistent impressions we have in uh, the West that is really inconsistent with reality. You know, when you go to university, uh, when you go to colonial university, you do not learn how to manage a nation. You don't actually get the intellectual technical capital that you think you do. You know, there is this yeah, there, through, uh, political science, science class. class. Exactly, right? There is this uh there is this impression that, you know, like 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 people of the diaspora can come back to Africa with our great education and really make a difference. And it's 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 like, you know, we have this intellectual and technical capital. All we need to do like I like the thing I want people to really grasp is that if you could have done that, why would you have not would done have that? Already. It's like, why would you have not done that in the hood? You know, like, like, like it, like, like I said, I, 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 when I used to go to meetings, like I go to, go to UAM, I would walk, like just for exercise, really, but I would walk, well, plus I, I was a cheap ass, oh, but anyway. Yeah. Like, I'm about to say, <laughs> don't, don't do that, don't make that excuse. Four <laughs> miles, I think four miles there and four miles back, all right? Uh, or probably three miles there, three miles back, or maybe it could have been two miles, I don't know, but, like, you know, I don't have, like, a whatever. But I would walk several miles, like, for an hour uh, there and then walk an hour back, right? And I would cross through the oh, black yeah, neighborhood, yeah. right? You said what? Nothing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I would walk through a black, I would walk through a black neighborhood and, like, I, I would go there and I would be like, wow, this was a good speech and blah, blah, blah. And then when I come out, I would be disappointed because I'm like, it doesn't matter how much I learned there or whatever, how much, you know, I picked up. You said what? 
I think you felt good listening to the lecture, but then when you walked out, you're not helping anybody. Yeah, you're not. You're not helping anybody. Nobody's being helped from that, right? I gotta move this food because this kid keeps walking in, grabbing food, which is not a bad thing, but it is actually maybe because he's hungry. No, 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 it's not because he's hungry. He's just, just interesting. Uh, he's interesting. Okay. okay. Like, like to explain, like what I'm saying is that you know, if you grabbing food, I'll just explain this. Parents, people, not parents. Uh, kids grabbing food and he goes back into his room, that's going to attract insects later. You know what I'm saying? That's not a good uh -huh. thing. So, okay. so you don't want him to do that. Uh, cause mm -hmm. if, unless he washes his hands right after, but he didn't. So, you know, uh, but yeah, uh, anyway, so this, this, that's just random parent tip 101. Uh, but yeah, intellectual technical capital. So you don't learn that. So like, 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 like the brother said, you go to political science class. Right. Political science class does exactly policy, whatever it is. Right. Those are teaching you if you don't go to an elite school, really, those are teaching you how to be subservient to people who have that power. You understand? You, 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 you go to a policy making class so that you could write up stuff for Hillary Clinton. Not to be Hillary Clinton, but to write up stuff for Hillary Clinton or write up stuff for Barack Not Obama. Not Hillary, Kamala you know? Harris. Oh, Kamala Harris now, right? Yeah. So, so you, that's what you're doing. You when you go to an economics class, you're not learning how to do banking. You're learning how to work with the banking families already in America. You're not learning how to make your own independent bank. You understand? Not to say that you can't, but that's not what you're learning there. You know, not to say that these aren't quote quote unquote basic human skills, but the the skill really involved there. I mean. Again, it's 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 very involved, right? The the bank, the, the, like for instance, America is really like you don't learn. Like this was an example I used inside of uh, the Book of Power, right? But America does not teach financing and banking. What happens is that America had banking families that teach that stuff to their children and pass it on to their children. And you going to university to learn about banking, you might. Learn about these banking families. I mean, most most surely, right? Hey, hey, but Morgan, Chase, but yeah. exactly. But you're learning how to work for them. You're not that's learning not how to be them, and that's why. So so while we might say, hey, we learn these technical and intellectual capital. Yeah, we're learning when we go to school. We're learning how to work for people with this capital. We're looking how to work with the bourgeoisie or work under the bourgeoisie. So now if we go to Africa with these intellectual and technical skills thinking that's all we needed, right? Then basically we're going there and we say, well, you guys are so backward. Where's the capitalists I got to work under? You understand? And that's, that's what it is. Like, like a lot of times that's what it's like when we are privately talking about this stuff, we're talking about, well, well Africa doesn't have a capitalist. You know, like we don't say it that way. You know, we say, man, this website's backwards, man. They don't have this or so on and so forth. Or, Who wants us to contact, blah, blah, blah. We say that stuff. Right. Or, man, they do it different back in Africa, blah, blah, blah. But the reality is that what we're not saying is that we don't have a capitalist there. You know, what was that? Very, Very true. true. Very true. Uh, was that was that? me. Sorry. Very true. <laughs> Hold on a second. What was that? <laughs> like, what? Like, what? Yeah, I thought it was a banshee, man. I was like, <laughs> I want to pull up my sword and like go on some adventure or some shit. Like, what was that? <laughs> You didn't like that one? All right, whatever. Uh, <laughs> all right, yeah, 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 it's very true. Yeah, it's very true. What were you going to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. The, the thing, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's really, it's like, like for instance, you know, some sister was like, I, she goes to Africa and she set up this business, it's like, like maybe like web design or like, or like, well, business consultation, right? So that's a good a skill that you got, business consultation. What is business consultation? And she, you know, she says, well, it's really hard to find work down there. And, you know, most of my clientele are foreigners. Like, most of my clientele are whites. So she goes on to Africa and she's helping these white people with business. Why? Because she's it's learned. The same people she says she wants to say. It's like she's learning how to serve capitalists. She's learning how to serve the bourgeoisie. That's what the school is. So you don't go to Africa talking about. You don't go to Africa talking about. 
uh, uh, like, like you can't say you have this intellectual and technical capital because you think you do. Because white man told you, hey, you know, you're pretty useful. He says you're pretty useful to the capitalists, and if you do not have the capital, then you done effed up. You would be, you would be much better off getting the capital because, and let's say, if you really want to make a change in Africa, this is something that everybody should understand. You really want to make a change in Africa in this colonial system, right? Or in this decolonized or this neocolonized system, then get your black ass some capital. Okay? You get your capital, and then a bunch of black folk are gonna be very, very qualified at serving you. That's it. You know what I'm saying? Because if I'm designing, if I, let's think about it. Let's say you, like Africa has a, lot of, has a large agricultural economy. Me designing websites don't do nothing for them. Maybe you can design some, uh, you can civil engineer and design some irrigation systems that can help. There you go. You can help them with. But, but, but look at this, look at this, you know. Understand what, what your audience. But look, look, design, no, 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 be honest. Look, look what you just said. Maybe you could design irrigation, right? You said that, right? Yeah. All right. You want to build an irrigation system. How much capital that costs? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. You don't got the capital. You 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 could you could go to these villagers and say, hey, you know, uh, I could design this irrigation system for you. I could design this water system for you. They say, oh, that sounds great. Nah, nah, All right. Yeah. What do you say? No, no, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I said, why are you yelling? Now you're not yelling, but go ahead. All right. So you say, I could I could develop this irrigation system for you. I could develop this big water system. And they're like, oh, really? How are you going to do that? You're like, well, first, I would need, uh, I would need uh, you know, 40 metric tons. Uh, uh, of, of steel, yeah, no, exactly. No. Steel. I need forty metric tons of steel and 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 a uh, and a, a drill, you know, a high power drill of uh, Mark 22 X, you know, like whatever, right? And they're like, okay, sure. Well, we'll work on that. They don't got it. That's what capital is. Cause see, there's uh. a factory in Europe that could pr produce that twenty. Like, like that's what happened with Dan Gote. When Dan Gote was doing this, uh, make, making this giant. Uh, drill into the earth, you know, he bought the drill from Belgium or something. You know, he bought the drill from Europe because they're not producing those drills in Africa. The there's no there's no steel there's no there's no steel bourgeoisie. When, when you look at America, for instance, there's this guy named Carnegie, right? He was monopolizing the iron and steel working thing. That's a bourgeoisie. You understand? So that now, if you wanted to build something in Europe, uh, sorry, in America, you would go to this guy Carnegie and say, "Hey, you know, I'm looking to build this skyscraper. I'm going to build the Eiffel Tower, right?" And he says, "Sure, I'll give, you, I'll supply you with this much steel, this cut this way, that way, so on and so forth." And that's where it comes in. If you have all this skill that you could design an irrigation system, and there is nobody who's with a big steel factory in Africa, then you either have to then you have to buy it from Europe. And if you do not have the money, the capital, you don't have anything of interest to this person in Europe to provide you with these metric tons of steel, then guess what? You ain't getting that damn irrigation system. And you, while you could design something that looks pretty damn nice to a bunch of villagers, the reality is you can't give them jack squat. You understand? Nah. What do you mean, nah? It's nah? <laughs> okay. All right. But anyway, uh, I mean, look. Uh, again, like, you could. Well, I mean, nah. I was, well, I, I mean, you're, you're talking yeah. about capital, but again, mm -hmm. I, I like to, you know, bring up. In what ways are you going to gain this capital? How are you going to accrue this capital to implement these changes? Who are you talking about? You're talking about... You talking about, you, you're talking about, you're talking you're about us? You talking about us as a people? Well, I mean, look, sure, like, like you said, capital, there. capital. You said, yeah, capital is like cap, like you said, like like depends on what language you're using. But capital is a, a, a can be accumulated. Capital can be well, directed. About capital needed to implement changes. You talking about like money? You talking about? Are you talking about money? Or are you talking about factories? That's, that's I mean, you you brought up capital. You said, well, for us, instead of talking about business consultants, we need to go bring capital. And then you can have your people work for you. You mean us you as said. African people? Okay, so like I said, yeah. you know, like you well, said, no, I don't want to give I'm no spoilers. When you, we, I don't want to give no spoilers. We're talking about, when well, we're talking about this Marcus Garvey speech, y'all got to go listen to, right? This Marcus Garvey interview, okay. got to go listen to. But uh, you, Marcus you Garvey. This better be fine. You've been boosting for the past few days. <laughs> Marcus Garvey was able to provide capital to Liberia. You understand? Yeah. Now, he did it through, like, you know, old school GoFundMe. You understand? 
like old school GoFundMe. Uh-oh. You know what I mean? Door. What'd you say? Instead of GoFundMe.com, go to the door. Or exactly. door, go, 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 door, door, dot com. You know what I'm saying? But he, 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 he was able to, you know, everybody pitch in, you know, like them, them ideas you heard. So that's, that's a yeah. way. The other way so that, is that, that's what I was thinking. Like, instead yeah. of just, you know, everyone likes to, wants to in their heart, you know, give back in some way, but everyone's doing it in an individual way. You don't of being, know. You, know happens, you can't trust other people. You can't trust. Like so, a lot of people didn't trust Garvey. A lot of people didn't trust Dr. King. A lot of people don't trust. Obviously, we, we see what happened with Garvey. We, what people didn't, they try to, you know, they yeah, messed up. Like up. I said, we talk about that in this, because I don't know what you're trying to imply now. Garvey is my, 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 my man. No, no, no. Uh, no I'm, I'm saying, saying yeah, a lot of people didn't trust Garvey, and that, that's what they, try, they brought him down. That's what I'm saying. I'm not disagreeing uh, with you. Uh, I thought you were saying that Garvey wasn't to be trusted. I was like, damn, my uh, guy. Uh, on my stream, nothing, like, now we're about to get red flagged. All. We about to get red flagged by the Pan Africanists. That's what I'm worried about. No, you know what I'm saying? Not, <laughs> not, no, not, not, not the nah, okay, I'm, just, I'm agreeing with you saying yeah, that yeah, they yeah. do not trust them. And that's yeah, you can't. Like I said, but the thing is that you can't. You it's hard to trust people. You know what I mean? Like, 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 especially with your money. You know, somebody comes around. Even like, uh, uh, I mean, not a little bit of money, but like, if somebody comes around and says, "Hey, you know, two hundred dollars for X, Y, Z," right? It's like, wait, do I know you? You know, and that's like a little, that's not even that much, but it's, it's enough to be like, hold up. You know what I mean? Well, for me, it's enough. Maybe yeah. for you, it's like, shit, okay, sure. You know? Yeah. <laughs> that's it? That's <laughs> Do it enough? No, you know what I'm saying, though, but like, 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 uh, cause like, and I mean, like, I, I, a person who's. I'm random asking for a dollar. I'm like, who are you? Why are you coming to me? Nah, I said a dollar, a dollar is like, yeah, you know. Like, I'm okay. saying someone like random, you don't like like a homeless like, guy asked me for a dollar. Sure, I'd be not no, talk about some just like, like in the store. Hey, what's up? Bro? Yeah, but like exactly, somebody if somebody because actually, matter of fact, that happened recently. There's this brother, uh, he, uh, I think it was here in America, who was and I just say that for PC, you know, <laughs> I usually I just say his brother, but a brother he was collecting money for some sort of black business industry kind of thing. He just ran with the money. In fact, it was that brother, the same brother, because I didn't know, but it was this, you know that there was this video of this dude who was just, like, flexing his different suits, you know, like, like, you know, like Steve Harvey? No, 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 like, this random, you like, random, like a random, like, you know, random vines or random TikToks or whatever, where, like, and it's just flexing this dude, suits. like, he's just wearing different suits, and he's just, like, look how, like, pretty much, like, modeling in different outfits, right? And people okay. are under the comments, like, that's the guy who said he was going to make this website, blah, 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 he just ran with the money, you know? Like uh, that's okay. what like that's that's a normal thing. Well, we know what the website money went to. Yeah, you understand? But that's a that's a normal thing in this world. Cause it's like if people don't know you, but they trust you with their money, you can you can run away with it. In fact, a lot of people have stories like that. Like a lot of people who are you know like like a that's lot of people, people in general though. Yeah. That's that's people in general. general. Exactly. So you know, it, it becomes name? tougher because like, even white people can't do this stuff. His name alone should let you know he was up to no good. <laughs> anyway, but like that's what I'm saying. Even even made off. even <laughs> made off with your money. <laughs> anyway, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what kind of made off? Made off's not that bad. Like, that's what made off. Bro, think money. about it. Like, I think that's his family name, but sure. Uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the thing is this that. Uh, yeah, like, 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 even white people, because otherwise, even white people would would raise up. Uh, I mean, they, they do okay. most of the times, but it's it's not as easy as you think. Because it's just like the stock, like like stock market or cryptocurrency. You know, there are coins that come out of nowhere. People of pump and dump. You see what I'm saying? Like of you said, of course, all the time, all the time. Of course, exactly. You know, but but again, you're you're, you're putting in real money. Now. While we talking, I'm I'm sure another one just blew up about five hundred percent. Shit, I just I just lost I just lost I just lost five hundred dollars just now. No, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm looking at it go down. What pump it up? No, I'm joking. But like, but like that's <laughs> that's the stock. That's that's everything. Everybody does this constantly. So Garvey shows up in a sea of this stuff, and people are just like, "Yeah, I heard that before." You know, see, been there, done that, got the teacher. But the reality is that that's a way. The other way is uh, another way. Obviously, is the government. Government has money because the government is taking taxes. Uh, churches have money because the churches are taking taxes. You know, you call them tithes, but they're taxes. You know, just taxation in, in general generates uh, uh, capital. Uh, outside of that, though, I mean, like you said, you know, you could just, you know, what they call, uh, whatever they call when you're spending better. Uh, they have like a fancy budgeting. term. Budgeting. 
No, no. There's like a fancy term for it, though. You know, like it's budgeting, but it's a fancy term that I wanted to use. But that's whatever. Uh, but th- those are other ways how to, you know, like, oh gosh, when you, like, 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 like they say you want to teach black people something. Financial like, literacy. Yeah, financial literacy. There you go. Yeah. So, uh, you know, financial literacy, like practicing that, like, yeah, or, or like, or you said, easier budgeting. But those are ways to create capital. Maybe not real capital. But like as a group, if you organize that capital, that 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 financial literacy, then yeah, you can accomplish things. Because even a church can accomplish things. Uh, that was my favorite oh. passage in the uh, in the um, blueprint for Black Power. Um, Amos Wilson. I read that. We one actually before. had a favorite passage in there. Yeah, but basically he describes a church. Like it's a, like he, he cites this article of a church that used the welfare. Uh, food stamps. Use the food stamps of the congregation uh, to, to build make, a, uh, make a grocery like store. Yeah, make a grocery yeah, store. Yeah. Make a, and then eventually, with the revenue generated from that grocery store, they end up owning like a bunch of businesses and being able to employ the people in that community. You know, like just <laughs> doing something. Yeah, just doing something. Just anything to generate a business. And that's another thing. To generate capital, you just have to generate a business. Really, uh, even uh, uh, Booker T. Well, Washington. That's easy said, said, uh, no. Of course, but that's what I'm saying. You need to buy. Everybody, everybody's an entrepreneur, but like just because you're selling like no, you gotta sell. You gotta sell what people really want. Anything. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so yeah. Booker T. Washington, uh, his students, they build uh, br- like they know how to Tuskegee. make bricks. Yeah, they, they are, but they're, they're selling. They 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 build bricks and they mm-hmm. sell them to people who are building houses. You know, even mm-hmm. white people who are building houses and they're quality bricks. And so, yeah, the school begins to generate a, a, a income, income and, and, and with you use that income correctly, you could uh, get capital, so on and so forth. So that's another thing. And of course, if you're regularly generating these bricks, you know, you technically would be that capital. Now, not necessarily uh, to that uh, large extent, uh, but still, like, like you, it could build up and accumulate. You know, a lot of people do not have, you don't have to stare it off. Like, for instance, the, like, there's a lot of examples from, you know, white people or whatever. But Ford, uh, you know, probably starts off, you know, hand making these, these cars, you know, or like, you know, small people, small yeah, yeah, people. That's how they did. Hand, oh, no, that's yeah. McDonald's did. Yeah, McDonald's as well. <clears throat> well, a- actually, what's his face? Ford is the one who begins automating it. But, the assembly line. Line. That's what he yeah. did. Yeah. But, uh, but like, that's it. You know, or McDonald's, like a food cart or this big capitalist in, uh, South Korea, uh, Samsung. Yeah, Samsung starts off selling groceries and stuff. You know, if I but, think Sony, Sony was started out making like ra- trying to make a rice cooker or something yeah. simple like that. Yeah, whatever. That's that's what it is. You 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 go from there, and then you generate the capital, and of course and now you Samsung's attract. Samsung's making like jet engines and all that kind of stuff. And tanks and uh, and and you know. 3D TVs or whatever, you know? That's uh, pretty interesting. All right, so so that's how you would get capital. That's what I'm saying. Uh, we will see, like, basically, you get capital from business, but also from thrift and, and you know, just that that taking advantage of uh, the market, in a sense. But also, yeah, also from richer people, because I think Samsung gets a lot of government support eventually. Uh, but I mean, that's, 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 actually, that's, that's where a lot of, of many of, you know, these major these companies, that's how they, they gain they most of their capital. They got the support from the government and they're exactly. funding for wars, funding for infrastructure. Et that's why you, that's why, that's why, that's exactly what I tell our people. I say, look, you get your capital, you get your, you get your, you get the attention of the politicians. That's why I try not to talk too bad about politicians in general, you know, like the uh, dictators in, in Africa. Fit in. Yeah. You got to get in where you fit in. Like, cause you uh, know. If I'm if I'm doing like if I do like some educational programs or whatever, right? And but I'm talking crap about the president, right? The president's yeah, yeah. gonna be like, oh, that's good for you. I'm gonna kill you now. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, but no, it, man, it's such a shame. I know, such a clip, you know. But if I'm doing good educational programs and I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't I don't bother the president. Or even if I say something nice about him, I don't know if we go that far. But if I do. You know, you already know why. Selling out like a motherfucker. No, I'm joking. But yeah, you start saying, oh, that's the homie, bro. That's, that's nice. Yeah, guy, like, oh, he, just, he just killed 20 people? Yeah, you my best, man. Don't oh, worry about it. Anyway, no, no. I, would, I don't think I'll do that far. But but either way, uh, <laughs> either way, I... <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. Anyway, but either way, you 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 do this, right? You uh you get the education program. Now you're the secretary of education. You understand? And you're making a difference for the people. You know? Now you're not necessarily a bourgeoisie per se, but you're making a difference for the people. Uh, anyway, let's keep going though. We will see 
under unfortunately that the national bourgeoisie often turns away from the heroic and positive path, which is both productive and just, and unabashedly asks for the anti-national and therefore abhorrent path of conventional bourgeoisie, a bourgeoisie bourgeoisie that is dismally, inanely, and cynically bourgeois. So basically that, right? Uh, we have seen that the objective of the nationalist parties from a certain period onward is geared strictly along national lines. They mobilize the people with a slogan of independence and anything else is left to the future. When the parties are questioned on the economic agenda for the nation or the regime they propose to establish, they prove incapable of giving an answer because, in fact, they do not have a clue about the economy of their own country. And again, you have to remember that there's no reason for us to, there's no reason for anybody to know about the economy of a country. Like, there's no reason for anyone who's not in leadership to know about the economy of the country. You know? Uh, like, like, realistically speaking, go back to Niede, right? Or Nkrumah. The secretary or the teacher might not necessarily know about all of the, the, the whole economy of their respective countries. Just like I or you do not know about the whole economy of the United States. You know? Where does the United States get its rights from? Where does the United States uh, get the pigs from? Where does the United States manufacture its metals? Where does, man where does the United States uh, manufacture its, uh, its lumber, its timber? Where, like, all of this, we don't necessarily know. So if we start describing to you, because listen to this, right? Even to this day, you know, a lot of black people have political agendas, right? Along the lines yeah. of, oh, Revolutionary Matrons here. Peace, Revolutionary Matrons. Hey, uh, peace. Uh, How you doing? Uh, a lot of a lot of people will tell you some political agenda, i.e., like for instance, I see this 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 thing, you know, because the left, the white left, is really popular. They're like defund the police, which means, and what that means is that you break apart the pig. Like they have an image, a graphic where the pig is split in half, and money's falling out, and there are hands pointing up, and the hands are, I think, like um, uh, healthcare and uh, education and so on and so forth. That right there is more so. Uh, distributing money or, 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 or distribution of the budget, but it's not the economy, you know, because where that money comes from, right? If we're, and, and this is the, this is the one thing that we have to realize the Democrats know where the money comes from. We call the Democrats imperialist swine or whatever. They know where the, they, they know the money comes from imperialism. You know what I'm saying? They know you're splitting up the imperialist money and that if you were to really shut down American imperialism, you'd be shutting down America's economy. They know that. When, 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 when you put this budget, when you put this huge budget into the military or, or the military budget, the military defense, you know, you're like, oh, why don't you take some of that military defense and put it in the schools? They know that this jet plane is getting much more money than all the students in, you know, in, in the first grade, you know, <laughs> you know it out. not really, but, you know, but like they know this is happening. You understand? You with your naivete. Or, or, your, or, your, or your, you know, you know your, your, your moralisms, you're saying, oh, no, you know, you, you're putting so much money in these, you know, you, you, you spent a billion dollars on a, you spent a million dollars on a, on a plane, but my kid can't even read, with the, you know, okay, right? Because you don't read, you don't teach your own kid, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, like, well, like, that's what, that's what it is, though. You I know, was say my kid can't read. Who fault is that? <laughs> but like, <laughs> aren't you there? <laughs> but like in America, it's unfair to say that because they teach people and they've been training people for generations to turn their children over to the state, and mm -hmm. the past two or three generations, unfortunately, bought into that. Kind of, sort of, sort of like, like what, what even, even David, David Walker, Walker was talking was about in my reading, my reading last night. Uh oh, Revolutionary Matrix. That, that when he said in 1822, he was talking to people, and their children were not being educated by the state. And they unfortunately, even then, had too much pride 200 years ago to acknowledge that the state did not serve them. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so that's it. That's it. You know what I would, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. So make sure you guys, by the way, check out, um, the Evolution Day Matrons channel. Uh, cause like I said, she's not only she on the, uh, Kitty Easy Network, but she's also giving out some good content. So make sure you guys check it out. And of course you can also join her on live. Uh, don't forget, you know, I, I, I just wish she gave us a... The only uh, reason I came on here is because I made a comment about capital, 
and YouTube straight deleted my comment. So I was like, wow. damn, what the? I didn't even see that. That's weird. I, didn't I know. Even see. Wait, no, I know you didn't. What did you say? It. I said that capital is generated. Capital are land, tools, and resources to create something, not necessarily money, and that capitalists are good at negotiating and coordinating the use of all types of capital, whether it's with money or other means. Sure, they don't want you to teach us. You know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> they don't want you to teach us. Well, that's what I'm saying. I, I remember I sent a comment on your thing, and I, I'm like, did I hit delete? I mean, did I, did I hit enter? Because it didn't go through. Like, just, just, it was weird. But yeah, that's it. That's just the straight thing. deleted, right? Like, I'm it's saying, like, like, I know I just sat here for 15, 15 seconds typing. typing. Yeah, like I, I don't know what it is, but you know, I kind of wish we did have our own uh, platform. Because at this point, it's just like, come on. But it is what it is, right? Um, let's keep going, though. We have seen that the objective of the Nationalist Party is from a certain period onward is greatly is geared strictly along national lines. They mobilize... Oh, I think I read that part. Maybe. Mobilize when the parties are questioned. Oh, yeah, well, they're questioning at the economic... So, yeah, you have no clue about what the uh, economy of the country. Uh, and that's what it is. Like, that's what it is. Like, if I'm suddenly hauled into the presidency, I don't have any clue. Uh, I could, you know, I could say... Like, that's what I'm saying. Obama's hauled into the presidency... And before he's president, he's like, I'm going to get out of Iraq. And then when he is president, he's like, oh, wait a second. We need all this oil. You know, if I pull out this oil, the prices of oil is going to skyrocket. And maybe some other people are maybe some other people are convincing him. Or, or even he says, if I do this, then Exxon Mobil is going to uh, do something, you know, because Exxon Mobil would be the bourgeoisie, a, a part of the bourgeoisie. So Exxon Mobil is like, oh, if America can't defend my interests here, then I'm going to sell my assets to another country, right? And then this hugely profitable venture for America, this hugely taxed venture for America, is suddenly, uh, you know, suddenly withdraws, and America now has no access to oil from, like, a several oil companies, right? And what is it to do now? You get what I'm saying? So, so that's what Marx is really talking about, too, when he's talking about the capitalist control of the government in the sense of, you know, you're, you're, you're England or you're America or whatever, and you have private, a private company that is uh, providing your citizens with oil, you know? And you cannot get the oil from this private company. You understand? Because this private company, because it's private, it can go to England or it could go to UK, or it could change the prices on you, you know? And you're at the mercy of that nation. So you're at the mercy of that company. And so that company says, well, I want you to go to war with Peru. And you say, I ain't going to war with Peru. And they say, well, I ain't going to sell you oil. And suddenly you're at war with Peru, you know? Because look, you pull out from the oil, the economy tanks, right? The, the citizens are angry. What? $20 a gallon? You know, you go to the, you go to the pump and it's $20 a gallon. Right, and and it's all because oh, and then you know, huh? Twenty dollars a gallon. Yeah, exactly. Well, what? How much you think? Exactly. How much you think? Like again, if Exxon Mobil says we're going to limit our uh, limit our trade with you, you know, we're going to send I'm you less to BP. oil. You said what? Yeah, exactly. And, and BP works with them. You know? all right, I'm going to Shell. No, no, right, come on, dude. Right? Okay, no, like you don't <laughs> even understand that. Like, I know. The relationship. I'm He's like, okay. He's like, all right, because right, it's like this dude knows every day. He's about to go down a list of like a thousand fucking. Like, like, when did you study all of the damn couple? <laughs> it's like, nah, we've not already been told that we really have an illusion of choice. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Period point blank. Period point blank. <laughs> yeah. So 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 that's what it is. Like 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 that's what the capitalists are. Now, Africa doesn't have these people. Africa, you know, you were quote unquote especially you're a nurse and you're like, well, I'm not going to like you could do what the brother was just saying, you know? If your name is uh let's get Mobilina, right? <laughs> Whatever, right? And you're like, I'm not going to be a nurse. What? I'm not going to be a nurse. <laughs> then he goes to Shell. I'm just doing his example. He goes to Shelly, you know? Uh that's it. Like, like, you know, like, you know, nobody need you, nurse. Nobody need you, doc worker, right? What they need is 
like if the if the if the owner of the ship says, "Well, I'm not carrying your goods to Japan." Right? Then suddenly you don't got it. Or if the port says, the owner of the port says, "Well, we're not going to you're not going to be able to trade with the outside world." Then you don't got it. Or if America shows up, like what like what happened to Cuba. If America shows up and says, "None of your nothing is going to come in or out of Cuba." Then suddenly you don't got it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but of course, that's a military, not so much a uh, But all right, the economy has always developed outside their control. As for the president, potential resources. Oh, see, so the economy of Africa has always developed outside of the control of these people, uh, of, of the of the of the of the, the colonized people. You know, so Nyerere being a teacher, the, he the, like the economy didn't depend on him. The economy depended on the governor of the colonized the colonial system, or the economy depended on the Queen of England. But it did not depend on Nyerere, the teacher, or Nkrumah, the secretary. And suddenly they come into power and they're like, you know, well, we need this, we need that, we need better schools, we need this, blah, 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 all these kind of issues. But then they see the economy and they say, wait, you mean that we were dependent on selling gold to a thing? And that's why we're called the Gold Coast, you know? Uh, and I think that was pretty obvious, but still. Uh, but there's also other stuff like rubber and, you know, whatever. Uh, as for no. the president, like you said, but like you said before, these people all can get on the phone and call each other. Where is the black man in these places that we can call? And the black Twitter in all these places. Yeah. Well, is that back back then, no. See, back then you didn't, you couldn't. Like back then, they could call each other, or they could send a missive or a letter somewhere. But yeah, but like, I see the thing is that, like, honestly, back then African people. That's what I'm saying. Like African people could meet up. Oh, we did meet up. We met up in Pan African conferences and so on and so forth. But it was just a bunch of, uh, like a bunch of people without power meeting up to talk about, you know, like 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 Twitter. Like it was it was pretty much Twitter back in the day. Maybe the people were a lot better read, you know, better traveled. But <laughs> much it's, better read. Trust. Yeah. Have you seen Have you seen Twitter in general? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but like, but like, it was basically Twitter. Just a bunch of people, like you know. Like, we look at them now with esteem, you know, Kenyatta, Nkrumah, uh, Nyerere, so on and so forth. They're all meeting up, and we're like, damn, yo, everybody everybody sitting down at that one meeting, like, you know, what it, what it would be to be in that room, right? But mm. they were just individuals who at the time read some books, exactly. They were just individuals who read some but books and were like, let's decolonize. Uh, what they wanted. So. Exactly. But, to, but, but, but whether they were captains of industry or the, or the leaders of the economy, or they developed the economy... That wasn't the case. Sure. You understand? Uh, oh, man, and that's that's what could, it is. You could question, well, those that may have been close to being like captains of industry from this year, finance years, were they even had the did they have the objective of doing what they did too? Maybe that's why they were the ones that actually, uh, you know, accomplished what they did. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So the economy has always developed outside their control. As for the president potential, and that's what Fanon's talking about, you know, that realistically speaking, you know, these are the people, right? So as for the president potential resource of the country's soil and subsoil, their knowledge is purely academic and approximate. You know, think again, Nyerere uh, uh, and Kruma. You know, not so much involved in uh, the country's soil and subsoil, but more so academic and approximate. They're, the exception being, I think it was that brother, who were we reading again? But there was this brother I was trying to read, and uh, he was like going in on the soil, like uh, he did like a whole uh, survey. Uh, it was uh, wasn't it Guinea Bissau? Yeah, Guinea Bissau. I don't know if it was what's his name. I can't remember his name. Though. Cabral. I think. I think. Oh, I think it was Cabral. It was either Cabral or Touré. I feel second Touré. Yeah. one of the two. But yeah, or Sankara. Who knows? But yeah, he was just going. Nah, in. it was Sankara. Like, it was Sankara. Yeah, but he was going in. He wasn't. It wasn't a joke. Like. Like he yeah. was just going in on. I'm like, down to the the, the the tiniest grain of sand. That's yeah, how he was. yeah. He was he was he was. But that's but that's rare. Oh, <laughs> Job also does that. Job also goes pretty deeply into uh, Senegal's soil and subsoil. You know, uh, but anyway, they can only talk about them in general and abstract terms. After independence, this underdeveloped bourgeoisie, reduced in number, lacking capital, and rejecting the road to revolution, stagnates miserably. See, they said they would reject the, the revolution. Because they want a revolution. Now, other people do not. The teacher does not. The secretary does not. But the bourgeoisie there are, are not the bourgeoisie, but the 
the wannabe bourgeoisie don't, right? He said, you cannot give free expression to its genius that was in the past hampered by colonial domination, or so it claims. The precariousness of its resources and the scarcity of managerial talent forced it for years into an economy of cottage industry. So, actually, it's pretty interesting. So he says, uh, undeveloped bourgeoisie. So again, he uses his use of bourgeoisie is really bad. So it really gets hard to under, like it's harder to read. But this underdeveloped, so when he says bourgeoisie or national bourgeoisie or underdeveloped bourgeoisie, you would want to think uh, ruling class, right? Uh, so he's like, this ruling class reduced in number, lacking, well, I shouldn't, no, it's actually hard. This is lacking capital and rejecting the road to revolution or the older uh, ruling class stagnates miserably or the privileged class or whatever. It cannot give free expression to his genius that was in the past hampered, hampered by colonial domination or so it claims. So before we were like, like if you were a nurse, you were like, I just get better pay, right? But then, uh, you know, you realize that when the hospital is destroyed or when, the, when your, your clientele are no longer these wealthy white people, like these West, wealthy colonists, that everything is already down, right? So the precariousness of its resources and the scarcity of managerial talent. Uh, so there's no more managerial talent, like I said. Force it, and the resources are rarer because you're not importing the resources. Force it for years into an economy of cottage industries. So I don't know what cottage industries are, but... Uh, but pretty much he's saying it's not going to be that same economy as before. Artisans and sacrifice. sacrifice. You said artisan? You said what? Artisans and sacrifice. So Sa instead sacrifice? of being, in, yeah, yeah, artisans. So instead of being a midwife, instead of being a nurse for an, an anesthetist nurse, you're, you're a midwife. midwife. Instead, instead of uh, facilitating, facilitating hospice, hospice care, care and or, or the cosmetic, cosmetic care, care that is so popular in the United, United States, States right, right now. now. You're doing, doing like, like basic wound care, care and, and, and basic health and hygiene, hygiene services, services and, and you're not doing it for as much money, money mm -hmm. because, because because you do, do have, have to have, have a generation of people, people or more, more that, are that are willing to take, take the loss because, because they, they want, want something greater. greater. This, this goes, goes back, back to what you said in the past about we look at what's in front of us right now and we don't make strategic plans for our future generations because somebody has to take that L. Yeah, somebody has to take that L. Uh, well, not the L, but you know, so, you, you have to, you have to, plant, you have to, exactly, you have to plant the tree today, not tomorrow, not wait for it, but if, even if that means that you have to dig the hole, you know? You know what the saying is, the best time to, to grow a tree 20 years 30 years ago, but the next best time is today. Who want who a tree 30 years, 20 years, man, come on. Why, why would, uh, I'm, just, I'm joking. Read, it's just read. I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> that's annoying, what do you say? What do you say? All right. It's an, <laughs> it's an evidently highly limited perspective. The bourgeois, I, bourgeoisie's idea of national economy is one based on what we can call local products, right? So, again, in an evidently highly limited perspective, the bourgeoisie's idea of a national economy is one based on what we can call local products. Because you're not going to have international products anymore. You know, obviously, like I said, you go to a metropolis, a metropolitan area, you can get food from all sorts of countries. You know, like here in New York, if I want to have Thai food, I can go get Thai food. If I want to get Nigerian food, I can go get Nigerian food. If I want to get Russian food, I can get Russian food. If I want to get pizza, I can get pizza. None of these places are local to me. And the people who are eating these foods or making these foods they're importing, for the most part, they're importing this food from outside of New York, possibly outside of America, right? There's a whole economy there. Now, if that's what is going on in these colonies, where the colonists could, you know, he's sit down inside of Africa and he's eating, you know, British food, he's eating uh, French food, he's eating Chinese food, he's eating so on and so forth. If you suddenly say, get out of here, colonists, we don't need your connections, we don't need any of that stuff, everybody's eating fufu. You understand? You, you, you no longer, you can't facilitate the Chinese store anymore because you're not trading with China anymore. You understand? Because the thing is that you never even traded with China. What happens is you traded with England who traded with China. But if you get rid of that, then all of your products are going to be local products. And the, the reality of the human condition is that, you know, a lot of times your local products are not, uh, are not enough. Or not say not enough, but... Uh, yeah, you, 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 like humans involve, like engage in trade to make, oftentimes make better products in the sense that, you know, 
without the coltan or without the, the the resources in Africa, a lot of the things that people enjoy in the West are would not be available. You know, uh, just the same. Uh, you know, people. But 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 this manufacturing that they do is not just materials from Africa. You know, like 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 I said about Rihanna, her makeup. It contains like this dirt or rock or something, but that rock or dirt, like casein or something, I think it's called, but it is produced, like it's found in India, you know, and, and, and small children get it, but which is the you know bad thing, but, but it's found in India. So as I say that if you want that good makeup that uh, Rihanna is providing, that quality makeup, you, you, it's not f anywhere local with the exception of probably India, but it might be local to India or a particular area in India. However, the other parts to it isn't. So again, it's it's more of a, a blended item, you know? And that right there is 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 a problem because you know you would want to develop a national or, or a pan and in, in our case you'd want to develop a pan-African economy. You know? But unfortunately, those pan-African connections don't necessarily exist. You understand? Because the the network that that requires isn't present. Now, what you would advocate for or what you would want is for it to be present, but that's not the case when you're just starting, right? So grandiloquent speeches are made about local crafts. Unable to establish factories, which would be more profitable for the country and for themselves, the bourgeois cloaks, and look, some sister said <laughs> artisanship, and there you go, cloaks local artisanship in a chauvinistic tenderness, which not only ties in with the new national dignity, but also ensures them substantial profits. This cult for local products, this incapacity to invent new outlets is likewise reflected in the entrenchment of the national bourgeoisie and the type of agricultural production typical of the colonial period. So the entrenchment of the national bourgeoisie is the type of agricultural production. So again, you know, even so, I want to point this out because you might be like, well, why don't we just do the Pan-African thing? Again, that's the night. That's the infrastructure. We were talking earlier about Nigeria, a road to Niger, right, or a road to Ghana, right. That's where. That's where and how you would have that sort of cross, you know, flow between this economy. Because now you can ship goods there, and they could be produced and combined by the you know industries there. But but again, what we're talking about is Nigeria in twenty twenty one. They do not have a road to Niger, Niger, right? In the same sense as what I'm talking about, right? They don't have a, a major road to Niger. But what that tells you is that, you know, they damn sure didn't have it 50 years ago. If they don't have it today, they didn't have it 50 years ago, right? Unless it was destroyed, but still, you know, if they don't have, they didn't have it 50 years ago. And they also don't have it in, in Ghana. So while we might say, well, why don't we just do that? Why don't we just blah, blah, blah? Because we're not investing in these roads throughout Africa. Or, or like, you know, those of you who were on the conversation afterward, you know, we were talking about uh, a high, like, like a, a passageway or highway throughout Africa. We don't even have that. Now, when you do have that, or in order to have that, you have to invest major capital. So, you know, there was this conversation. Uh, people were saying uh, China and blah, 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 and how China went to Jamaica and built the highway in Jamaica, where a lot of people can't really drive it because it's like a $33 toll. But the reality is that when people come to colonize or when people come to trade or whatever, they are building infrastructure to move the, re to, to find an easy passageway from the resources to the uh, trading, to, to, to the trading outpost, all right? Or, or to the factory or whoever, but they move the resources to where the resources need to be. And that is something we don't have, and that's something that we didn't have. So notwithstanding that, you know, we might say, hey, why don't they do that? But what they did have was they had a way for the resources to go to Europe, right? So they had a way for the resources, the roads of Africa, even to this day, all kind of focus on these port cities, you know? On these cities with uh, with 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 uh, access to the water, in order that uh, that water that, that could be travel that could travel up uh, by way of sea into Europe, or you know, in a more advanced time, they would go to the airport, 
So they have roads that develop that are going to the airport. And a lot of Africans are not expanding on this. What we, what we need to expand on is, I mean, air, air travel could obviously work, notwithstanding, uh, you know, to Africa, but also uh, travel to and from between countries, uh, whether it be air travel or uh, driving uh, traveling. But anyway, uh, or transportation, right? And actually, I want to say this. So uh, just, to, just, to, just to give you that. So one of the things I'm going to, well, one of the, at the end of the Book of Power, uh, for those of you who are still interested, uh, at the end of the Book of Power, there is these different occupations that I, I talk about that African people should engage in. One of them is to is transportation. Like one of the studies that we really need to focus on is this transportation study. So as I say that people who graduate from a program, like a real African-centered program, uh, some of them should focus on transportation, being able to transport things to and fro, whether that is like I said, uh, air, land, air, or sea, you know, that's not something that we typically focus on. And for that, you know, we get screwed over. Uh, or to, uh, land, air, sea, or people, actually, because you also want people to be able to travel to and from. Uh, but anyway, so the, the cult for local, blah, blah, blah. So independence does not bring a change of direction. The same old ground harvest, cocoa harvest, and olive harvest. Likewise, the traffic of commodities goes unchanged. No industry is established in the country. We continue to ship raw materials. We continue to grow produce for Europe and pass for specialists of unfinished products. There you go. There you have it. And, and, and it's, it's like, I don't really like this book. I'm not going to cap, but I could see the value in it. You know, I mean, I, I could see the value in it because this is something that he's, ta again, he's talking about North Africa for the most part, right? 1960 for the most part but it applies to today this is the issue with quote-unquote independence we are not we have not changed and we call it we call it neocolonialism we shouldn't even but it but it's a good word we call it independence we call it neocolonialism but we are doing the same damn thing from before you know say what you will if you guys were following me on that martin delaney speech uh martin delaney was talking about how to you know use some subsistence farming as well as some cash farming cash crops that is so much more meaningful than just continuing to do this oil this olive and cocoa harvest and continuing to sell those products to europe because the europeans could now say well we're gonna buy it for much less and if we don't buy it for much less then we're gonna buy it from somebody else we're gonna do what what uh uh Machiavelli was, was, was joking about. We're going to go from Ghana to Gabon. Okay? We, we could get cocoa from either one of you. So we're going to get them pennies on a dollar. Right? And because we don't come together to say, you know what? Africa, I mean, uh, this resource from this part of the world goes through this particular hub or this worker co op or this network of farmers that are all, like they did in Italy, that are all selling this resource for the same price, all get paid, without that type of centralized structure, they're going to continue to pit us against one another. Yeah, that's what, that's what it is. That's what it is, in the sense of, that's why you want to establish a bigger nation because if you do not establish a bigger nation essentially they can always pit the small nations against each other you know because again you cannot have you can't expect loyalty between people of different nations you know so if Gabon is selling the cocoa because if you're a cocoa seller or a cocoa grower in Gabon your thing is to sell that cocoa you understand you're actually competing against the cocoa seller in Ghana already. But if Gabon and Ghana are the same nation, right? You're no longer competing. You know, if, if, and particularly this, if you sell it to the government, you sell it to the government, the government sells it abroad, let's say, right? Then you're no longer competing. And what's more, you also want, see, you also want to, realize that our people what we're people have to do is that we have to say to ourselves look we're growing cocoa or we're growing olives 
let's make these factories so that we can have uh, cocoa, like we can make chocolate, right? Or we can make olive oil, right? We don't need to send it to Italy so that they can make olive oil. What we have to do is we have to say to ourselves, we're producing oil, uh, we're producing olives, we can also produce oil, all right? So you get a factory in one of these countries and then they buy the olives. Now they can sell the olive oil to throughout Africa. Again, that is something that could work, but instead of doing that, we're going to the same thing and we're saying, okay, where do you used to sell oil to? Oh, you sell to Italy? Okay, sure, keep doing that. And then we wonder, and then when, when Italy says, okay, so you don't know how to make your own olive oil? No, nah, we don't know how to do that. Okay, cool. So I'm going to get these, these olives are not that worth that much to me. I could probably, I'll probably give you 20 cents for it. And they're like, okay, sure. I mean, I, mean, I, I guess I, I spent the whole year growing this olive, you know, and I can't even feed myself because I spent the whole year growing olives, right? So sure, I'll take the 20 cents. At least that will get me, you know, buy. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a scam, but, but that's, that's, that's the thing. If you don't, if you don't engage in either Pan-Africanism or African nationalism, just simply, if you don't engage with smart leadership, because this goes back to the leadership, if you don't engage in a new system or just an independent system, then you're going to be dependent. And as the proverb in Africa goes, dependence is slavery, right? So yet the national bourgeoisie never stops calling for the nationalization of the economy and the commercial sector. In its thinking, to nationalize does not mean placing the entire economy at the service of the nation or satisfying all its requirements. To nationalize does not mean organizing the state on the basis of a new program of social relations. For the bourgeoisie, nationalization signifies very precisely the transfer into indigenous hands of privilege, privileges inherited from the colonial period. So again, that's what nationaliz nationalization is. Nationalization is. Uh, since the bourgeoisie has neither the material means nor adequate intellectual resources, such as engineers and technicians, it limits its claim to the takeover of businesses and firms previously held by the colonists. The national bourgeoisie replaces the former European settler as doctors, lawyers, tradesmen, agents, dealers, and shipping agents. For the dignity of the country and to safeguard its own interests, it considers it its duty to occupy all these positions. Henceforth, it demands that every major foreign company must operate through them if it wants to remain in the country or establish trade. So look at that. So for the dignity of the country to safeguard its own interests, it considers its duty to occupy all these positions. So now you want a piece, like basically you have a company, ExxonMobil's working in your country, right? It's working in your country to extract oil. And it's working with the European colonists, the British colonists, whatever, right? Uh, essentially, ExxonMobil's obviously an independent private company from, I want to say America, but it's probably not America, but it's just an independent company, right? Uh, it, what, what, what happens is, after the revolution, they were working with the former governor that you just kicked out. Now you're saying one of two things. Either you work with me, ExxonMobil, which obviously is the case, but when you're working with me, I want more money. Or I want the money. I want this money. I want to negotiate this, so on and so forth. Or we're going to take your business. You understand? That's what nationalization means. It means that you're going to take the business from these private companies, right? Which sounds good, but again, this is where the war starts because if you take a business from an American citizen, right? Uh, then America is gonna say, hold on a second, right? That's, my citizen has certain rights around the world. Oh no, it's not even that you have rights around the world, but if you're a citizen paying taxes and you're paying this American government, you're paying for protection. You know, it's kind of like the old school mafia or whatever, but the old school, uh, you know, gangster. The old school gangster, if you wanted to do business in an area, you would have to pay protection money. Uh, you, you had protection money. Or either they will mess up your business, or if somebody else messed up your business, they wouldn't come defend you. You understand? Today, you call them police, you see? That's what police are doing. You know, people don't realize, but the police are there to protect commercial interests. You understand? The police are there to stop you from rioting, to stop you from stealing. You understand? In order to protect the, the, the businesses, the private businesses in your community. But it doesn't stop at the border of America. The military of America is there to protect the private, in, the, the interests of the international businesses. And so when we say that this country went to war, yeah, they went to war for that exact reason, but that's what it's supposed to do. You understand? Because this, 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 this business, this ExxonMobil, is paying America taxes, you know, big taxes, 
And if you, a small little country, says, okay, we're going to kill everybody in your factory and take it over, and so on and so forth, right? America's not just going to be like, well, I mean, you did it, and it's on your land, you know? It's not. You, 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 you're calling for a fight. Because I can't remember what country it was, but there's this, I think it might have actually been Cuba once upon a time. But it's like there was this United, United Fruit Company or something like that, right? And it's working, probably in Cuba, let's just say it's Cuba. And then I guess Castro and them say, we're going to nationalize. Oh, no, they say, we want you to do X, Y, Z. We want you to produce X, Y, Z. And them as a private business are like, no. And so Castro says, we're going to nationalize and take over your business. Right? And then America says, okay, we're going to embargo you because you're doing stuff that nobody likes. You know, which is you're just stealing from people. But you can steal from people because it's your nation. But again, that's the complication. I hope that was a good explanation, by the way. Uh, I think it was. Uh, henceforth, uh, it demands that every major foreign company must operate through them if it wants to remain in the country or establish trade. You see what I'm saying? Henceforth, it demands that every major foreign company must operate through them. That's what the national bourgeoisie, they basically take over the business of the uh, other people. Or they're going to take your business. You see what I'm saying? The national bourgeoisie discovers its historical mission as intermediary. As we have seen, its vocation is not to transform the nation, but prosaically serve as a conveyor belt for capitalism, forced to camouflage itself behind the mask of neocolonialism. The national bourgeoisie, with no misgivings uh, and with great pride, revels in the role of agent and is dealing with the Western bourgeoisie. You see what I'm saying? So you either, so you have United Fruit Company, so Clifford versus Castro could have, just had the United Fruit Company continue what it was doing. You understand? Because that's what it was. Gonna, that's what it wanted to do. When Exxon Mobil's inside of Togo or whatever, it wants to just continue what it's doing. Don't, it don't really care what's going on outside of its borders. All it cares about is what's going on in its borders. Now, Togo could send their military and say, "Yeah, you're done. We're kicking you out of the country." But then the West is going to say, "Whatever." The other option is that the Exxon Mobil says, "Hey, you know, we'll pay you." some good money to continue working here you know we're not really bothering anybody you know air quotes but we're not really bothering anybody and we just you know we're just looking to just extract this oil from the earth and we're going to pay you and that's what it is and so the western bourgeoisie he says sure because it's free money i mean sure they might be violating some people in the in the in the area possibly right but what's that got to do with you in the city is what you thinking you know but and it's why? African leaders never rewrite the ownership laws like they've done in other countries. Because in some countries, you like cannot own land if you are not a citizen of that country. Uh, why don't some? Well, again, like it pays. You know, I mean, the thing is that at the end of the day, because you got to remember who these people were before the revolution. You know, like they were the people who looked on like they were basically Fanon, no disrespect to Fanon, but they were the people who looked on at the uh, at what's going on, like 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 looked at what the colonists were doing and said, you know, I want a piece of that. I want a piece of that action. That's what I really want. Like, like, you know, like, um, like, for instance, you, you hear this today, like where you're, you're at work and your boss is pulling in the big money. You feel like you're doing some a good job yourself. You feel like you deserve a raise. You feel like you deserve more money. But you're not getting more money. Your boss is getting all the money, right? You get a little bit of raise. You get a little raise every once in a while. You're getting like two more pennies or whatever, right? But your boss is getting these big bonuses, right? The, the way how this works is that now, let's say your boss, the, the country gets together and kicks out your boss. Do you now destroy the whole co company that you were at? Or do you go sit in your boss's seat? You understand? Because like your whole, the whole time your boss was there, you wanted to sit in your boss's seat. whole time your boss was there, you wanted to get those big bonuses. Now when they kick your boss out, when your boss is fired, do you, do you, uh, uh, let's say, let's say, let's say let's do it this way. Your boss is fired and you're tapped to lead the organization somehow, somehow, right? Do you take home the big bonuses too? Or do you change the whole system? Do you dismantle the company? No. You 
get the big bonuses that you wanted before your boss was fired. That's what it is. That's what neocolonialism is. Basically, these white people are there in this other country and they're, they're, they're trading. They're, they're working with Exxon Mobil. They're getting this big money, so on and so forth. Then the community gets together, they revolt, they chop off this dude's head, right? And now you, you're familiar with this organization and you say, what do you say? You say, okay, sure, I'll work with Exxon Mobil. Because that's what you wanted to do the entire time. You were not this peasant, you know, who was, you know, farming nowhere and didn't know anything about Exxon Mobil. You know? You, like you, you weren't that guy. You were you were the guy who was uh, working with the guy who was working with Exxon Mobil. Your colleague left. Now you like like you're gonna take his position. You were working there. You don't know anything else. You don't know anything about farming. You know, I mean, and and see that's what I'm saying. Like our people expect our people to be like, okay, you know, now that the boss is gone, let's just dismantle the system and create something entirely new, right? And that, that sounds good on paper, but like if we're going through real life, right? How real humans experience life, right? We realize that a real human, when the, like when, when the boss is fired, right? They go and they're tapped to take the seat. They're going to take that seat. You know what I mean? When the CEO resigns and then the, 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 the vice president or the, or the whatever, you know, he's going to take that seat. He's not, he's not going to, you're not going to, like, come on. Like, realistically speaking, ideally, sure, in some sort of other world, possibly, you know, this person shows up and says, you know, things were running this way and, you know, this person was getting all these bonuses that I really wanted from ExxonMobil, but now that they're gone, we should, Charlie, do something new. We should take over ExxonMobil. We should say, ExxonMobil, get out of our country. And, you know, like a whole new, like, that would be nice. You know? And again, of course, you know, ExxonMobil's not going to just take that sit, laying down. You know, ExxonMobil's going to show up and be like, oh, you're the new boss? Okay, here's how things work. And you're like, hey, no, I'll tell you how things work. And they're like, oh, okay, I guess you didn't understand. You understand? Because, 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 again, like I said, like I said in the beginning of the broadcast, a lot of people want to miss that. But yeah, white people, white humans are killers. Humans are killers. White people are killers and humans are killers. You know? Uh, all right, so let's go. Uh, role of, of dealing with the Western presidency. So this lucrative role, this function as a small-time racketeer, this narrow-mindedness or lack of ambition are symptomatic of the incapacity of the national bourgeoisie to fulfill its historic role as bourgeoisie. So again, he's, he's claiming these people are bourgeoisie. They were never bourgeoisie, right? But he's claiming they were. And then he's like, they're not even fulfilling their role as bourgeoisie. Yeah, because they don't own any capital, you know? The dynamic, like again, if you if you... Are gonna work with the Exxon Mobil. Exxon Mobil is the cat as the bourgeoisie. You're not the bourgeoisie because you're working with Exxon Mobil. You're just the middle person. You're just the person that Exxon Mobil goes to so that you keep the natives off of Exxon Mobil. You understand? So that you keep supplying people to Exxon Mobil. When Exxon Mobil steals somebody, you look the other way. That's all you are. You're not the bourgeoisie. You know, and we have to understand this. This is actually pretty complicated. Because again, like I said, you can read this book, and I, I, you know, you don't have my commentary, and you read it, and you think he's, you think what he's saying makes sense, and it makes a little bit of sense, but you want the context. You know, that's what I'm that's what I'm giving. All right. So anyway, the dynamic pioneering aspect, the inventive discoverer of new world worlds aspect, common to every national bourgeoisie, is here lamentably absent. So the dynamic pioneer, yeah, the pioneering aspect, the inventive, discovery of new world aspect, common to every national bourgeoisie, is here lamentably absent, right? Uh, yeah, so basically the bourgeoisie, a lot of people, a lot of people do this. I think even Nere did this, but they kind of praise the bourgeoisie, uh, particularly the bourgeoisie of America. Uh, but they, they, they praise them for their pioneering spirit. They're, you know, trying to take a change, make a difference. Like, say what you will, a lot of people don't like this guy, Jeff Bezos, but... Like, he decides to sell books, which was like, who does that? I mean, I do that, but, like, not as good as him, obviously. But, uh, who like, he decides to sell books, and then eventually he makes this website or this industry where he's just involved in damn near everything. And, and it, it just makes a change. It's different from what we were used to. You know, before Amazon, if you wanted... Uh, well, if you wanted a book, actually, if you wanted a book, it's pretty different, difficult. Well, you'd have to order from the publisher. The publisher will call, will charge you quite a bit in shipping. Uh, if you wanted a uh, like anything anything else, you would go to the mall and pick it up. 
Uh, today, it's like you could literally, there could literally be a virus outside. And you don't, like you're not at risk because you can just sit on your ass and get the product you wanted in two days. You know? Uh, that's different. That's not, that's, that's different. Uh, like not to be, not to, like, and that's not, not a praise or nothing, but, you know, that's the kind of energy you wanted. Now, here, check this out. I'll tell you this. I know this person in Africa who wanted to get a, my book, right? There's no way for them to order my book in Africa. In fact, Amazon doesn't even deliver that far because the postage system wasn't even developed where they're at. You know what I mean? Like the postage system's not even developed where they're at to the point where, you know, in order for them to have gotten something, they had to contact somebody that they knew in another country to deliver it to them, and then they had to then send the package, and it was like a long, it was like, like a long process. There was another brother, in fact, who used to talk to me all the time, and he was like, I want to get your book, but I just can't even order it where I'm at. You know what I mean? Or like, even like the country, in fact, in fact, the country wouldn't even allow him to use, like spend U.S. dollars. Otherwise, he'd be like red flagged or something. And, you know, it's, it's the same thing all over, you know, like 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 here you have uh, what's going on in Nigeria. I don't know if it's still going on, but like they ban Twitter like just and it's like a normal thing in Africa where they would like if before an election, they would like turn off the Internet or something along those lines, you know, just things that could sabotage people who were having like a business uh, that was related to the Internet. It just sabotaged automatically uh, just for the whim of of uh, these, uh, these quote-unquote national bourgeoisie. So he says, at the core of the national bourgeoisie of the colonial countries, a hedonistic mentality prevails because on a psychological level, it identifies with the Western bourgeoisie from which it has slurped every lesson. It mimics the Western bourgeoisie in its negative and decadent aspects without having accomplished the initial phases of exploration and invention that are the assets of this Western bourgeoisie, whatever the circumstances. In its early days, the national bourgeoisie of the colonial countries identifies with the last stage of the Western bourgeoisies. Don't believe it is taking shortcuts. In fact, it starts at the end. It's already senile, having experienced neither the exuberance nor the brazen determination of youth and adolescence. In its decadent aspect, the national bourgeoisie gets considerable help from the Western bourgeoisie, who happens to be tourists enamored of exoticism, hunting, and casinos, right? The national, yeah, so if, uh, a tourist, so yeah, yeah, so the national bourgeoisie gets considerable help from the tourists, you know, who like hunting, like casinos, like exoticism. They might like your women. And again, that's what, that's what it is right now. There are, I told you guys already, but there are people who are in Africa just, like, like, like we know what's happening in Thailand, where people go to Thailand just to mess with children. But it's the same in Africa, same in Kenya, same in Senegal, same in Jamaica, same in so on and so forth. There are people who go there to mess with children, or mess with adults, but a lot of times it's mess with children. Either way, and not just boys, or not just girls, but also boys, they are like, and the national bourgeoisie is like, well, as long as it's not my kid, you know? The national bourgeoisie establishes holiday resorts and playgrounds for entertaining the Western bourgeoisie. This sector goes by the name of tourism and becomes a national industry for this very purpose. We only have to look at what has happened in Latin America if we want proof of the way the ex-colonized bourgeoisie can be transformed into party organizers. The casinos in Havana and Mexico City. The beaches of Rio, Capacabana, Copacabana. I have my hand in the way. And, my, and the, this, this cursor in the way. And Acupoco, the young Brazilian and Mexican girls, the 13-year-old mestizos. I just told you. I just told you. I wasn't even sure if he was going to say it. So I was like, let me just say it in advance. I told you. The pedophilia uh, are the scars of this deprivation of the national bourgeoisie. Uh, let me go to this, though. To this day, we know about Mexico City, Rio, Copacabana, Acapulco. To this day, we hear about that. Casinos in Havana. You know? Th this is what it is. And, and again, like I said, the 13 year old, like this is what uh, that guy that people allegedly complain about who was killed in prison or whatever, right? What was his name? Whatever. But yeah, him. He, he, he was about this, 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 this thing. They have white people right now putting up pictures of themselves, posing with girls. And you're looking at these girls and you're like, these are underage women. They're underage, clearly. And these white guys, like, these white guys already have their way with them. You understand? But their parents know. Because it is lacking in ideas, because it is inward-looking, cut off from the people, sapped by the congenital incapacity to evaluate issues on the basis of the nation as a whole, the national bourgeoisie assumed the role of manager for the companies of the West 
and turn its country virtually into a bordello for Europe. I want to say this. I, want, I really want to go stress this. I really can't stress this enough. So the, I'll tell you, I went to school in the Midwest, actually. Uh, and there was this sister, the sister who came in and she was telling us about the trafficking. Like, this is the same time I heard about the Congo and the brothers told me to read this wretched of the earth. So it was a long time ago. But she was a speaker there, too. And she was talking about the Congo. I mean, she was talking about the, uh, the trafficking, you know, child trafficking, sex trafficking. But she was like, it's mostly children. And then she said something that, you know, I guess to this day I remember, which was that, you know, in order to sleep with one of these kids, it was like 300, 400 bucks, right? Uh, and she then said, she then said, it wasn't the working class people. Like the only people that could afford this were like richer, wealthier people. You understand? And it wasn't the working class, you know? Uh, so to say that, you know, and she was speaking from first hand. Now, she also said that, because she was a sister, she was a black woman, but she was like, it's mostly white kids. Uh, you know, like mostly white people who are being sex trafficked. She just had to be the unfortunate black kid. But the, the, the thing is that that is an industry. That is a whole economy in America, right? And America technically has laws and protections and this is a taboo and they're not really desperate for money. They're not really hard up for money, so on and so forth. So if that's the case in a rich old America, right, then what do you think about other countries? You understand? What do you think about other countries that do not have the economy here? You know, rich America is, you know, because this even happens in New York. Like, I was told, I don't remember the area because I didn't really commit it to memory, but, and like, in New York City, you know, if you go to this certain area at night and everybody knows about it, everybody in the community knows about it, you could see children holding hands being trafficked from one car to another, you know? And they were saying, look, the police know about it. You know, if you or I know about it, the police know about it, they're, it's, it's a system. You understand? It's a system. If, if you or I know about Thailand, the people in Thailand know about Thailand. You know? It's a system. Like, we've never been to Thailand. We don't want to be to Thailand. We heard about that. We don't want to. You know, lady boys, they call them, or something like that. They have boys. This is like before transgenderism was a thing, uh, like a popular thing in the West. They have little boys who, like, you know, pose as girls because they know where the money's at. And they mess with foreigners. You know, if there was like a movie like that, no, 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 no. But um, yeah, you guys get it. In fact, no, all right, I'll say it this way: the, back in the day, there was a there's a popular song called uh, I think "Ooh, me so horny, me love you long time," right? "Me love you long time." That line or that 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 commentary is from a Western movie, a white movie, where this guy is like a soldier and he's in a he's in a country like an Asian country, and the Asian girl is like trying to solicit sex from him, uh, trying to solicit him to pay for sex. As a soldier, uh, and of course, you know it's 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 a it's a funny line, and you know people like it or whatever. But uh, that's a normal thing, you know. That's a normal thing, and I I don't mean to harp over it too long, but you guys get it uh, because it is lacking in its ideas because it's inward looking. Yeah. Uh, once again, we need only to look at the pitiful spectacle of certain republics in Latin America, U.S. businessmen. Banking magnates and technocrats jet down to the tropics and for a week to 10 days wallow in the sweet depravity of their private reserves. You know, and then today, you know, when this guy is killed and we're making fun of him, ah, ah, yeah, he's such a pedophile, he's such a sick person. His father and grandfather and the grandfather and father of all the politicians and all the politicians themselves, they've all done it. They're all doing it. In fact, in fact, the whole thing about him was the fact that the reason why people said that he was even killed was because everybody else was doing it. He was organizing it. Who knew too much. There you go. Because every and it's not it's it's, it's not it's, it's, that's the thing. It's like everybody else was doing it. He's meeting up with the Clintons. He's meeting up with I don't want to say the Obamas, but he's meeting up with uh, whomever. Right. He's meeting up with the Trumps and so on and so forth. He's meeting up with all these people and they're all doing the same damn thing. He's meeting up with all these celebrities. They're all doing the same damn thing. It's and again, look, look, this is Fanon. He's not writing about this individual. This individual wasn't even born yet. 
Okay? This individual wasn't even born yet. He's writing about the people of his time. If it were being done in his time, and it were being done today, right? Then it's been done by quite a bit of people. He's not a rarity. You understand? It's a normal thing to, to sexually exploit other people. It, it, and, and remember this, a lot of reasons why people even came, like why people even came to America was because they hired this Queen Caliphia, right? Queen Caliphia is a mythical uh, myth that these white people made that said, oh yeah, there are some beautiful black women in Western uh, America. You understand? So they made, it's, it's called California, named after Queen Caliphia. They just made up a queen, and white people flooded and flocked to mess with, it was like a, supposed to be like an all black woman, you know, paradise or something like that. They flooded and flocked to go and get themselves some free tail. That, that's partly why a lot of Amer white Americans came to America. If they left their country, left their home, left their way of being in order to go and mess with black women, what do you, and, and here's the thing, if you, if you go on, well, once upon a time, I don't remember, I don't know if now, but if you go on this website called Craigslist, you could go into a section and you could see a lot of black women are trying to sell their bodies because the white people are buying it. You go down to a trucking stop. You know, these, these white boys who drive in trucks, you go to truck stops, you can see a lot of black girls walking around, you know, understanding that white people will get that. And this is America. So you know damn well you go to a country that's not as well to do. That's what's going on. Do you understand? And this, everybody knows what's going on. You know, we, we kind of protect and shelter ourselves if we don't know. You know, but everybody knows what's going on. Rent a Rasta. What is that? White women going down to, 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 to Jamaica. White women going down to Senegal. White women going down to Abuja. White women going everywhere. You know, white men, same thing. Going for kids and, and, and women and men. Same thing. Sure. And it, I mean, it happens, and I, and I want to just point out, it happens, you don't have to leave the country in order to get this, you know? Uh, yeah. You don't have to leave the Like, there are white people who are, like, let's say you go to Manhattan. You go to Manhattan, nice wealthy area of Manhattan. They are preying on little boys. In fact, that's what happened to this, mother, this, this dude. He just got in trouble for that. Ed Buck or something like that. He was messing with these bunch of black boys. Bunch of black boys and then murdering them. Yeah. I think, I think, I think, I think this, this is a good, good time, time to bring up Sarah, Sarah Bartman or Sartiji Bartman. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the fact that she is hot and thigh and she was endowed with a big butt. Mm -hmm. And her, her family were basically in the agricultural business. These Englishmen, these Frenchmen came over there. Okay. And they, they, on, On one, one hand, they, they offered her an economic, economic opportunity, opportunity to get, get out of the village, village using her body because of what she looked like and how she was endowed. Mm -hmm. But she wound up being sex trafficked and enslaved. And, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then they produced all these documents saying that, oh, she signed up for this and she wanted this and she wanted that. When the reality is that, okay, she may have wanted to, to not, not be enslaved but she, to to get out of the village but she did not want to be enslaved so she may have wanted the economic opportunity and said okay I can be a burlesque girl they probably said something about dancing and some form of modeling because that's what they still call it to this day you see ads for models and then they got her out of her country away from her people and she's now sex trafficked and enslaved as a sexual uh excuse me as a sexual slave to these people traveling all, all over, over the, the world, world to, to be, be exploited and for over a hundred years after she died her body parts and organs were still um uh, embalmed and what the preserved in a mm -hmm. museum to mm -hmm. be gawked at yep you know I, I want to say, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? To this day, if you like, if you're a girl, you're, you know, you're a good looking girl or whatever, you might be enticed by stripping, right? And you're enticed by stripping and then you realize that the money for stripping does not come from stripping. It comes from that back room. You understand? It comes from prostitution. But you, you got your foot in the door 
through the stripping and you realize, hey, you know, I, I left my old job. I quit. You know, I got a little bit of pennies or whatever for the first day. And then, uh, and then the income kind of slowed down. What, uh, what can I do? And then that's where, you know, when the economic pressure comes in, that's where you're suddenly bought. You understand? First, a little bit, then a lot. Then you start losing yourself. You know, it's, it costs more, it's more money if you take drugs with this person while you do it. And eventually your whole character erodes, your whole, your whole body deteriorates. And then you're a husk of a person dependent on drugs, dependent on, 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 on interaction, no value, no skills. And then you're tossed into the garbage for the other young, vibrant, naive girl who they can destroy. That's what and happens. Not only, and not only that, but for those, like the mind of the people that lead these businesses is perverted. So what they do to entice you is that they they favor you. They have their customers. They themselves. They don't mess with you at first. And then they just shower money on you. And then you become accustomed to a lifestyle. That all of that money that they were showering on you, making it rain on you to do, okay? You become accustomed to that lifestyle. You got a nicer car. You get into a nicer apartment. You're accustomed to going to get your hair and nails done every couple of weeks. You're accustomed to eating at these types of restaurants, these types of clothes. You become a brand label person. No, I'm not going to Hudson's. I'm not going to the local store. I'm going to the expensive store. I want the designer things. I deserve the best. And you haven't been asked to make that compromise. And then, like he said, that economic pressure to maintain that lifestyle comes into play. And once that economic pressure to maintain that lifestyle comes into play, they dry up the money that they were giving you so that they can force you to do these different things. To take subtle force, exactly. Because, see, if you are helping somebody live a, 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 a good way, right, and then you threaten to take it all away, right, and not just take it all away, but, you know, or you say they're in debt to you. You find out... That, you know, you look at the papers and they're indebted to you uh, several thousand. Like, you know, you're like, hey, you know, that dancing you did didn't produce that car. That dancing you did didn't produce that building. You know, so on and so forth. Eventually, they, you know, now you can't necessarily run away. You could run away or try, or maybe, right? But the reality is that you suddenly are in this bind. You're in this financial situation. Your name has these debts that need to be collected, so on and so forth. And you're either destroyed or you just go along with, okay, I'll get my debt. I'll repay, I'll repay this debt somehow. You know, or, or I won't have, you know, like I won't just die and starve and all that. You know, um, it's complicated. But again, you know, that's, that's the way of the world. Like that's how people move in this world. Um, but let's continue. Um, but yeah, thank you for that, sister, by the way. You know, because that's, that's the thing that we, we like to understand about how... There are systems that, you know, like even on an individual level, they translate into a national level, you know, because again, I mean, let's just just because they go on a national level, you know, that's how the West engages with the uh, the, the rest of the world. Right. Uh, it, it it would it would create these debts. It would create these pressures. It would give this nice lifestyle. It would trade one day to. Uh, or like, for instance, the Chinese, uh, not the Chinese, I'm not the saying anything about the Chinese, but the Chinese might give you this, this hospital. But then when you cannot afford to pay back the loan, you have to surrender other things. You know, you have to now surrender this port, this seaport, this collateral that you signed up. You have to do these things. You, you can't just go into homelessness. You can't necessarily, you could try to say, well, okay, take back the bridge. We can't take back a bridge. You understand? Now... You owe us, and you got to pay up, and now you got to do other stuff. You got to do the dancing, and you got to do more than dance. You know what I mean? That's what it is. That's how. That's how. That's like negotiating one hundred and one. That's a. Uh, that's that's what it is. The behavior. Oh, that's manipulation one hundred and one, right? The behavior of the national landowner is practically the same as that of the urban bourgeoisie. As soon as independence is proclaimed, the big farmers demand the nationalization of the agricultural hoglands. Uh, through a number of schemes, they managed to lay hands on the farms once owned by the colonists, thereby reinforcing their control over the region. But they make 
no attempt to diversify, increase production, or integrate it into a genuinely national economy. So you, you, you remember that question I got I asked you guys? I said, what happens if you vote and so forth? You, some people said, give it to the experienced farmer, right? The experienced farmer could well be the, the, the farmers, the big farmers uh, before colonization. In, in fact, it could well be a white person, you know, but let's just pretend that it's not, right? Uh, but it very well likely will be, right? But if it's not a big white person, it could be that same, uh, you know, farmer's hand I was talking about, the one who wanted to be the farmer but couldn't because land was only owned by white people. Now that land is owned by black people, they, uh, they have the farm, but they're not trying to diversify or increase production or make a national economy, okay? That is an economy that facilitates uh, a more industrial uh, uh, like, you know, industrialization, they're just going to keep doing what they were doing just on a wider scale, even if it's not even uh, physically sound, right? So, in fact, the landowner calls on the authorities to increase a hundredfold the facilities and privileges now theirs, but once reserved for the foreign colonists. I just told you guys this. The exploitation of farm workers is intensified and justified. So, again, the, the farm workers, you know, you know, you're not farming all this land by yourself. You have farm workers. And they were exploited, obviously, Right? But now that the white boy is gone, you're continuing this exploitation. And in fact, it might be that you make it worse because you're because like you like we were saying earlier, we want people to sacrifice. You know, if you want to really have a good economy, you might need people to sacrifice that in some regards can be looked at an intensified and justified exploitation. You see what I'm saying? Now, obviously, you know, you know, you guys don't want to hear that because you agree with that, obviously. But, I mean, this is also one of the things with socialism, and this is why I say you want to have a deep reading and look at things very carefully because whereas it makes a lot of sense to ask people to sacrifice more, the reality is that if you ask people to sacrifice more, you're also saying you want to exploit them more. You're justifying exploitation in a deeper sense, you know? And it's, 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 a, it's a tough sale, but that's why, and I mean, you're going to justify it regardless, but that's why you have to phrase it pretty well. But he says, capitalizing on two or three slogans, these new colonists demand a colossal effort from the farm laborers. In the name of national interest, of course, there's no modernization of agriculture, no development plan, no initiative uh, for our initiatives imply a degree of risk and would throw such milieus into panic and put to flight a weary, overcautious landed bourgeoisie, which is sinking deeper and deeper into the ruts established by colonialism. In such regions, initiatives are handled by the government. So again, the modernization of agriculture. You don't have the capital. You do not have, like, you, you kick out the Europeans. You do not suddenly have access to factories. And in fact, I would say, one of the critiques I have of Niede, in fact, is that Niede, he's like, I need to have a modernized economy. But you can't get a modernized economy because then you don't you because you don't have you can't produce your own tractors. Now, you might think, hey, making a tractor is pretty damn easy. Well, go ahead and try. Right. The reality is it's not. The white people can make factories pretty damn easily, though. So in order to get a factory, I'm not sorry, not factory, in order to get a tractor, they can make white people make tractors pretty damn easily. In order to get a tractor from Europe, you have to give them you look at the money. Like, let's say let's say. A million dollars, right? Whatever. The reality is this, though. You do not have a million dollars. Or if you do have a million dollars, even if you do have a million dollars, you're going to have this little tractor. This tractor is going to be effective on one farm. You have a thousand farms. You understand? It's, it's again, government is not simple. You know, it's not simple. And even if you're critiquing, like like here, he's critiquing this bourgeoisie, the reality is that you can go and order five tractors. And see, it might be a million dollars to a white person. It's a one and a half million dollars for you. You might go ahead and order one and a half million. Uh, you might order five of these. That's a $7.5 million, right? Uh, you might go ahead and do that. You're providing for five out of a, a thousand farms. People say, hey, you did all the spending. You said we were going to modernize the economy. You said we were going to modernize agriculture. And only, and I haven't seen anything. Because if, if you're 995 of the farms, if you're one of those, you don't see anything from, your, uh, from this new government. Now, the five farms that do see it, they're making bank. They're doing good. They like it. They like this, uh, this leader, right? But again, who do you give those five tractors to? And if they break down, who's going to repair them? You know, it's, it's really complicated to, 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 to run a new nation, but that's why I stress, you know, this education. 
this education and of course, you know, you want to do the nationalization of resources, but you also have to make an inventory of the resources available in Africa so that you can do that steel factory that, that, that would facilitate the development of these tractors. Uh, you, you want to have access to this iron ore or the hesemite or whatever. You want to have access to that stuff. And if you do not have access to that, if your country, if your nation doesn't have access to that stuff, you want to engage with nations within Africa that do have access to that. But when, it, when, when you don't even have that at hand, yes, you're going to be like Niere, uh, for better or worse, and you're going to say, hey, I'll buy a tractor from you for a million and a half. And when you do that, your country is now in debt. Okay? It's indebted, and now you have to pay up that debt. And if you don't pay up that debt, you're in trouble. And that's what it looks like in reality. You know, on paper, it looks, on paper, it's pretty easy to condemn people. On paper, it's pretty easy to say, oh, you did the wrong thing. In reality, this is what it looks like. Um, I think I'm actually taking much longer than I should. <laughs> so I'm going to try to go through. Uh, in such regions, initiatives are handled by the government, is a government which approves them, encourages them, and finances them. The landed bourgeoisie refuses to take the slightest risk. It is hostile to gambling and ventures. It has no intention of building upon sand. It demands solid investments and quick returns. The profit it pockets are enormous compared to the gross national product and is not reinvested. It only mentality is to hoard its saving. The bourgeoisie, especially in the aftermath of the independence has no scruples depositing in foreign banks the profits it has made from the national reserves resources major sums however are invested for the sake of prestige in cars villas and all these ostentatious goods described by economists as typical of an underdeveloped bourgeoisie again just to you know just to you know explain that they're not, they're not taking the risk you know if you want to like like for instance the, the guy jeff bezos say what you will about this guy i think it was like for 10 years amazon was a failing company you know, or maybe five years, 10 years. Like you invest a lot of money into this website, into this business. I'm going to get more books to people, whatever. For like 10 years, he's not like he's barely breaking even. You know, now he's the richest person in the world. That's a risk because the reality is that there was a lot of people who made websites that didn't go off. In fact, when I was younger, when Google first showed up, I was doing this other website that I thought was pretty good. I can't remember the name now, but oh, Lycos. I was searching stuff using Lycos. You know, uh, Lycos, where is Lycos now? You know, like you take this, you take out your money and you say, I'm going to make a search engine and it's going to be an effective search engine. And it's going to be so on and so forth. How's it going to have a nice little dog? People are going to like it, you know, blah, 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 blah. I liked it. Google came around. I was like, I'm not going to do Google. That's stupid. Right. Who's going to use Google? You know, there, there, there was, there were other meta searches or mega searches and I was kind of using them. But then, like I said, you know, eventually Google sells to the right people. You know, it's all of a sudden inside of, you know, you go to college and they're like, oh, use Google. And you're like, oh, really? Okay, sure. And then eventually, Lycos, Yahoo, Yahoo used to be a big thing. Yahoo's huge. It went down. So, so again, you know, the, the landed bourgeoisie, a lot of people are not going to take those risks because you take those risks and you just lose a lot of money. And if you're not a real bourgeoisie, if you're not really productive, if you're not really getting wealth, then when you lose a bunch of money, you just lost a bunch of money. And, and, and you're probably, you're probably broke now. You understand? Not only you probably broke, but you're not going to, be able to survive unless you, unless you do something else. Uh, that's that's the system. So he's like, no, they're not doing that. If anything, they might invest in cars and villas and so on and so forth, but they're not going to buy a tractor. You know, they're not going to build. They're not going to make a, a tractor thing because, like, the thing is, again, you have a thousand farms. You 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 yeah, you have a. I said a thousand farms. Yeah, you have a thousand farms or ten thousand farms. Let's say you have ten thousand farms, right? You have 10,000 farms and then you build 10,000 tractors. Now what? Nobody else wants a tractor. You know, you, know, you, 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 know, you know, so you build this factory that costs about 500 tractors, you know, right? And then you're slowly, you're slowly selling tractors to different farms around you. It's not, it's not, it's not like you're not, you're not interested in spending 500 tractors, right? Uh, which is, you know, let's say that would be like it costs you like a billion dollars. Oh, not a billion dollars, but like let's say a hundred million dollars to make a factory to build uh to build tractors right you're not gonna you're not gonna spend a hundred million dollars to build tractors knowing full damn well you can't sell tractors you know 
Uh, we have said that the colonized bourgeoisie, which attains power, utilizes the aggressiveness of its class to grab the jobs previously held by foreigners. In the aftermath of independence, faced with the human consequences of colonialism, its wages of ruthless struggle against the lawyers, tradespeople, landowners, doctors, and high-ranking civil servants who insult the national dignity. It frantically banishes the notion of nationalization and Africanization of the managerial classes. In fact, its actions become increasingly tinged with racism. It bluntly confronts the government with the demand that it must have these jobs, and it does not toned down its virulence until it occupies every single one of them. So basically, you, you go to this colonial system, you kick out the colonial government, but there's still white lawyers, white tradespeople, white landowners, white doctors, and white high-ranking civil servants. And then you say, that's disgusting. We shouldn't have any of these people. They're disgusting, so on and so forth. Now, uh, Fanon is calling it racism. That's really what you should do, to be honest. But again, that's going to cost something because... You know, it's going to cost something if you as a people did not train yourselves or did not develop yourselves to be lawyers, tradespeople, landowners, doctors, and high-ranking civil servants. You know, that's why I said education is one of the most important things that you want to uh, uh, establish, right? Translator, uh, serious translator, no. The urban proletariat, the unemployed masses, the small artisans, these commonly called trades, small traders, side with this nationalist attitude, but in all justice, they are merely modeling their attitude on that of their bourgeoisie. Whereas the national bourgeoisie competes with the Europeans, the artisans and small trades pick fights with Africans of other nationalities. So you see that. Pick fights with uh, Africans of other nationalities. We still have this to this day. You know, this quote-unquote xenophobia. You know, people uh, accuse the African-American of having the xenophobia, but the xenophobia is all over Africa. And, of course, you know, there are people in America who say, hey, look, why are you guys saying that we're xenophobic when there's xenophobia all over Africa? That's what it is, right? Uh, pick fights with uh, so on and so forth. So in the Ivory Coast, outright race riots were directed against the Dahomeans and Upper Volton. So the home is ben Benes and Upper Volta is Burkina, Burkina Bays. You know, that's Burkina Faso who controlled much of the business sector and were the targets of hostile demonstrations by the Ivorians following independence. So you see, you have that quote-unquote, you know, you have that uh, xenophobia even in his time, okay? And it's just something that continues to this day. It's just something that's normal uh, for, for people to have. It's not something that you advocate. It's not something you support. It's not something that gets you rich. It's not something that gets you better off. But it's a normal reaction for people to look at other people as outsiders and and do that so we have switched from nationalism to ultra nationalism chauvinism and racism there is a general call for these foreigners to leave their shops are burned their market boots torn down and some are lynched consequently the Ivarian government orders them to leave thereby satisfying the demands of the nationals. In Senegal, it was the anti-Sudanese demonstration that caused Mamadou Dia to state the people of Senegal owe their blind belief in the Federation of Mali to their affection for its leaders. Their deep attachment to Mali has no other basis but a repeated act of faith in the politics of these leaders. The issue of Senegalese territory was no less alive in their minds, especially as the Sudanese preference, presence in Dakar was far too visible for the problems to be overlooked. This is the reason why, for far from causing any regrets, the breakup of the Federation was greeted by the mass with relief, and there was no support from any quarter in its favor. So you see that. The Senegal, yeah, so there was an anti-Sudanese feeling that Mamadou uh, Dia says uh, that I guess they were part of the Federation of Mali, and they broke apart from it because of that. So, translated note, President Malian, uh, Mamadou, and this is the quote from Mamadou, dear. Uh, Whereas certain sectors of Senegalese jump at the opportunity offered by their own leaders to get rid of the Sudanese, who are unwelcome elements in the business and administrative sectors, the Congolese, who watched in disbelief as the Belgians left en masse, decide to put pressure on the Senegalese established at Leopoldville, Leopoldville and Elizabethville, and in turn, get them to leave. So again, you see the same xenophobia. It's just a common thing, you know? Common thing throughout Africa, common thing for African people. You know, you can't just critique when it's in America, when it's just a normal thing that people do all over the world. In fact, that's the thing that caused, uh, that was behind the, uh, the uh, you know, like the things that happen in Europe, right? So anyway, as you can see, the mechanism is identical in both cases. Whereas the ambition of the young nation's intellectuals and bourgeois businesses are thwarted by the Europeans, for the majority of the urban population, competition stems mainly from Africans of other nations. In the Ivory Coast, it is the Dahomeans. In Ghana, the inhabitants of Niger. And in Senegal, the, Senate, the Sudanese. Whereas the demands for Africanization and Arabization of management by the bourgeoisie is rooted in a genuine endeavor at nationalization, but merely corresponds to a transfer of power previously held by the foreigners, the masses make the very same demand 
their own level, but limit the notion of African or Arab to territorial limits. Between the vibrant calls for African unity and this mass behavior inspired by the managerial class, a number of attitudes emerge. So basically he's saying that there are people talking, the leadership talking about Pan-Africanism, but when they say Pan-Africanism, they really just mean we want to take the place of the white power. And this is the, obviously, this is a critique that we hear from a lot of socialists, to be honest, where they say, oh, you just got to be the black bourgeoisie, right? And of course, again, they're not really the bourgeoisie, but they are engaging the bourgeoisie of the, of, of the capitalists, right? Uh, so they're not really fighting capitalism, and that's a legit complaint. But then it also you see in this same passage where he says, the people who are not of the intellectual and elite class, they are kind of like hey, like we're not even talking about Pan-Africanism. We just want this country for ourselves. Uh, we just want the benefits of this country for ourselves. This is our people. This is our land. This is so on and so forth. This is the same thing. And the thing, again, you see it applies to American discourses today. You see it applies to the discourses in Africa today where a lot of people, a lot of African people say they don't want to go to South Africa. You understand? A lot of people from the continent of Africa do not want to go to South Africa for this very same reason. But you see that it's something that was already like been there, done that, got the teacher. So, so there's a constant pendulum motion between African unity, you know, Pan-Africanism, which sinks deeper and deeper into oblivion and a depressing return to the most heinous and virulent type of chauvinism. He says it's a pendulum swing. You have Pan-Africanism, then you have chauvinism. You have Pan-Africanism. This is where the people are. The leadership is more saying, or the leadership and the intellectual and the intelligent and the people who can calculate how to win everything are saying Pan-Africanism. And the people, and they're being exploited by people who probably are not Pan-Africanists, but they have the lingo. Whereas on the other end, you have people who are just chauvinists. It's so, it's actually pretty. Like, like, the, the, like and here's the thing about books. I want to say this about books. They can give you this vicarious, and they can tell you what was going on once upon a time. Well, people were thinking once upon a time. And that's, that in of itself is value. I don't think there's value in the theories of the past so much. But just to give you that concrete look at what was going on, that in itself has value. And that's why you could read white people as well as black people. Because you can, you can pick up on what was going on at the time. Uh, as for the Senegalese leaders, who were the main theoreticians of African unification and who on several occasions sacrificed their local political organization as well as their personal careers to this idea, they undeniably bear a great deal of responsibility. Although admittedly in all good faith, their mistake, our mistake, under the pretext of combating balkanization was not to take into consideration the pre-colonial factor of territory, ter territoriality. Our mistake was not to give enough attention in our analysis to the factor exacerbated by colonialism, but also a sociological fact which no theory or unity, however commendable or appealing, can eliminate. We let ourselves be tempted by the mirages whose configuration is the most satisfying for the mind, and taking our ideal for reality, we believed we only needed to condemn territoriality and its natural offshoot, micro-nationalism, to get the better of them and ensure the success of our chimerical endeavor. So that's uh, a Mamadou again. Uh, and he's just saying, like, yeah, you know, like, we, we, want, we didn't want this balkanization. We, don't, we didn't want this stuff. We, we thought, hey, look, well, it's not about territoriality. It's be about Pan-Africanism. We sacrificed for this thing. But realistically speaking, that element of territoriality, of tribalism, that element still exists. Like, like you got this brother uh, here from Nigeria. He still, like, he's, not, he's never going to not be Igbo. You get what I'm saying? Uh, he's never going to not be uh, that people. And so when you go to Igbo land, you go to the Biafra, you know, you still have that feeling for that peace, you know? And, and, and it might not be so severe or so strong in this individual, let's say. But to some people, yes. You know? You're talking about ancestral land. You're talking about giving up and giving in to another people, you know, and, and it's, it's a hard sale, you know. So from Senegalese chauvinism to Wolof tribalism, there's but one small step. And consequently, whereas the petty mindedness of the national bourgeoisie and the haziness of its ideological positions have been incapable of. Oh, so, so basically what they're saying is this. So, so here's actually pretty interesting. So they're saying that, OK, let's say you give up on this uh, Igbo and but, but you embrace Nigeria, right? Now, all of a sudden, Nigeria is the foreigner. You know, once upon a time, you know, 
the, the Fulani or the, uh, the Yoruba, we're the foreigner. But then you say, no, 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 we're all the same people, we're Nigerian. But now you're the same people, but the Senegalese aren't. So, so now the Senegal, so, so you see, you, you, you up the tribalism, you know? So that's what she's saying. She's, 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 she, or, I don't know if it's a he or she, but they're, they're saying from Senegalese chauvinism to Wolof tribalism, there's but one small step. And consequently, whenever the petty mindedness of the national bourgeoisie and the haziness of its ideological positions have been incapable of enlightening the people as a whole or have been unable to put the people first, wherever this national bourgeoisie has proven to be incapable of expanding its visions of the world, this return to tribalism, and we watch with a raging heart as ethnic tensions triumph, since the only slogan of the bourgeoisie is replace the foreigners, and they rush into every sector to take the law into their own hands and fill the vacancies. The petty traders, such as taxi drivers, cake sellers, and shoe shiners, follow suit and call for the expulsion of the Dahomeans, or taking tribalism to a new level, demand that the Fulani go back to their bush or back up their mountains. I just mentioned the Fulani, and this is something we hear today. Hold on a second. How many pages do I got left? Oh damn! I thought I was. I thought I was almost finished. Uh, you guys still follow me? You still? You guys still here? <laughs> uh, uh, the triumph of federalism in certain young independent nations must be interpreted along these lines. We know that colonial domination gave preferential treatment to certain regions. The colony's economy was not integrated into that of the nation as a whole. It is still organized along the lines dictated by the metropolis. Colonialism almost never exploits the entire country. It is, con it is content with extracting natural resources and exporting them to the metropolitan industries, thereby enabling the specific sector to grow relatively wealthy, while the rest of the colony continues or rather sinks into underdevelopment and poverty. So, so you say colonialism almost never exploits the entire country, is content with extracting natural resources and exporting them to the metropolitan industries, right? So therefore, only certain people are benefit. In the aftermath of independence, the nationals who live in the prosperous regions realize their good fortune and their gut reaction is to refuse to feed the rest of the nation. The regions rich in ground nuts, cocoa, diamonds, stand out against the empty panorama offered by the rest of the country. The, nas the nationals of these regions look upon the others with hatred, detecting Envy, greed, and murderous impulse. The old pre-colonial rivalries, the old intertribal hatreds resurface. The Balubas refuse to feed the Luluas. Uh, Katanga becomes a state on its own. Albert Kondonji crowns himself king of southern Kasai. Basically, what he's saying here is that... Because that's, that's the difference between socialism and capitalism, in a sense. Or that's the, thing that, that's the difference that people think. That's the thing that a lot of people think is the difference between socialism and capitalism. This idea that... Your region could produce groundnuts, cocoa, and diamonds, and then you would distribute it to the rest of the nation. Whereas in reality, if your region produces groundnuts, cocoa, and diamonds, then you will be compensated for the diamonds, cocoa, and groundnuts, particularly if you're the one digging it up or you're the one growing it, right? Now, but the region that doesn't do this groundnuts, cocoa, and diamonds, then it's not going to benefit. And, you know, the idea that, okay, well, let's make everybody benefit, that's a nice idea. And that's, that's, what, that's what some people believe socialism to be. You know, this, this distribution of wealth in a sense. But again, like when you're talking about these huge African nations, it's really, it's really not as simple as that, you know? Because again, if you're, if you are selling, like let's say you go to the diamonds thing, right? If you are doing this diamond industry, what you want to do with this money that you get from the diamonds is invested in better mining equipment right or invested in better housing for the people who work in the diamond section right now if you're but if you're doing that if you're putting that money towards that then no it's not going to benefit people who do not have the diamond like who are not near the diamonds or not extracting the diamonds or whatever uh now the other objective the other thing is well you have this money from the diamonds and then you just distribute it to people who aren't even working in the diamonds right that would be the socialist thing where it's like you know people on the other side of the country are now getting new roads and so on and so forth. So you're not investing in the and in, 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 in like making diamond mining safer. You're not investing in the housing of the diamond farmers or the diamond miners. It's that's that's the complication of of the world, you know. Uh, and 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 sometimes people don't agree with that. So this guy right here, Albert Kalanji, crowns himself king of Southern Kasai because he says, "Look, Southern Kasai is where the wealth is, you know, where whatever I'm extracting is." And that's and I want this money to benefit the people there, my people here, not necessarily the people on the other side of the like northern Kasai or on another city. African unity, a vague term, but nevertheless, one to which the men and women of Africa were passionately attached. And, I, and, I, and just, to, just to clarify, uh, just to clarify, 
notwithstanding that, even if you were to say, like, like the socialism in a sense that you were, might advocate for, might even say, not even just the diamonds, like, the, like you're not even going to invest in the diamond per se, but you're going to give this wealth to people on the other side of the world, you know? Like, not on the other side of the world, but like the other side of Africa. So, like, you might be digging something up in Congo or whatever, and then you're like, but the, the person in Ethiopia should get a new road, right? And again, that's where it becomes a lot less clear, a lot less realistic, you know? Uh, but anyway, African unity, a vague term, but nevertheless one to which the men and women of Africa were passionately attached and to whose operative function was to put incredible pressure on colonialism, reveal this true face and crumbles into regionalisms within the same national reality. Because it is obsessed with its immediate interest, because it cannot see further than the end of its nose, the national bourgeoisie proves incapable of achieving simple national unity and capable of building a nation on a solid constructive foundation. The national front that drove back colonialism falls apart and licks its wounds. So again, you have to, you have to, you have to, we have to think about a different economy, because if we think about you have a colon, you have a colony, and you, you, you improve, and you, 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 you still keep the main colony, you're going to have the same problems. This ruthless struggle waged by the ethnic groups and tribes, and this virulent obsession with filling the vacancies left by the foreigners, also engenders religious rivalries. In the interior of the bush, the minor confraternities, the local religions, and marabout cults spring back to life and resort once more to the vicious cycle of mu mutual denunciation. In the urban center, the atrocities are confronted with a clash between the two major revealed religions, Islam and Catholicism. Colonialism, which the birth of African unity had trembling uh, on its foundation is now back on its feet and now undertakes to break this will to unify by taking advantage of every weak link in the movement. Colonialism will attempt to rally the African peoples by uncovering the existence of spiritual rivalries. In Senegal, the magazine Afrique Nouvelle secretes its weekly dose of hatred against Islam and the Arabs. The, Leban and the Lebanese, who control most of the small businesses along the west coast of Africa, are publicly vilified. The missionary opportunities remind the masses that the... Uh, so this is actually pretty interesting. He's He's saying, Tony is again, uh, he's trying to say that colonialism is at fault for the Arabs and the Lebanese and the African and the, and the Islam being uh, vilified in the African unity paradigm. But that's exactly what they should be. You know, he's, it's not necessarily a colonial response. It's more so, you know, you realize that they're not African people per se. But anyway, but, you know, I, it's kind of questionable why Fanon is in North Africa. In Algeria, to be honest, so it's just kind of like goes into that idea where uh, Africa, like there are two different types of Pan-Africanism. There's the continental Pan-Africanism, and there's racial Pan-Africanism. And he's kind of seems like he's a continental Pan-Africanist. So his idea of African unity includes Le 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 Well, I don't know. If, I don't know why I would include Lebanese, to be honest. But yeah, the Lebanese who control most of the small businesses along the west coast of Africa are publicly vilified. The missionary opportunity to remind the masses that the great African empires were dismantled by the invasion of the Arabs long before the arrival of European colonialism. They even go so far as to say that the Arab occupation paved the way for European colonialism. References are made to Arab imperialism and the cultural imperialism of Islam is denounced. Muslims are generally kept out of managerial positions. In other regions, the reverse is true and it's the indigenous Christians who are the targets and treated as conscious enemies of national and so that's actually pretty interesting how he's blaming colonialism for what would be like you know basically he's blaming colonialism for like uh, what's his name um, Chancellor Williams book you know what I mean which is just kind of like ridiculous but you know it is what it is but you kind of see where the socialists kind of get it from you know where they're going to like make it seem like we're just following the colonial lives when no, like, this is what happened. Anyway, colonialism shamelessly pulls all these strings only too content to see the Africans, who were once in league against it, tear at each other's throats. The notion of another St. Bartholomew's massacre takes shape in some people's minds, and colonialism snickers when it hears the magnificent speeches of an African unity. <laughs> Dang, I, oh, this guy, man, I'll tell you, man, he would piss me off if I was reading this to myself. Within the same nation, religion divides the people and sets the spiritual communities fostered and encouraged by colonialism and its apparatus at odds with each other. Totally unexpected events break out here and there. In predominantly Catholic or Catholic or Protestant countries, the Muslim minority redoubles its religious fervor. Muslim festivals are revived and Islam defends itself every inch of the way against the violent absolutism of the Catholic religion. Uh, ministers are heard telling certain ind individuals that if they are not content, they should go and live in Cairo. In some cases, American Protestantism transports its anti-Catholic prejudices onto African soil and uses religion to encourage tribal rivalries. All right, family. So that was uh, pages one to uh, 96 to 
108. Make sure you guys uh, check out the Twitter. I mean, the, sorry, not the Twitter, the, uh, the, the YouTube video. And just drop a like. It's been 2 hours and 43 minutes, so I know it's been a long time. I've been standing this whole time, so I'm going to go sit down. But other than that, thank you so much, everybody, for listening. This is a pretty interesting book. I thought that was a pretty interesting section about how colonialism causes us to dislike Islam and Arabs. That was a new take. But, you know, I could see that being used against us in some way. But otherwise, I think it was a really good uh, section. And I'll probably hear from you guys tomorrow. Uh, until then, though, of course, Shamiam Hotep.